Hey guys, this is Pimp here. I uh, got another little trick for you guys. Uh, I heard about this uh, channel on YouTube that has a lot of good analysis on it. You know, a lot of good points to be made and uh, fuck. I did it again, it's just Thorne's stupid YouTube channel. Right, this is going to be episode 70 of Counterpoints. Our guest for this one. I mean, we, we you know, we set the bar pretty high on the last one was. We had someone come in who's in the midst of an era, not according to you, of course, but, you know, <laughs> famous uh, hater of the North American region, aren't you? I, I personally, <laughs> I just see the potential in the Moses. So someone in the, middle of, I know, someone in the middle of an era, you know, just won like a million dollars. He's riding high, you know, could be about to dominate the whole CS world. But what we like to do on this show is show the whole community, you know. We like to show from the very high up, the kings, the aristocrats living at the top of society in some some Blade Runner-esque future, and then we go down to the ground floor. We come to the bottom and we see who are the people making up the same. What's the lifeblood, the grassroots? What, what is this? Of this thing? What? what? <laughs> just, just letting people know, you know. People well, need to know okay. there's all there's all stages, levels, and uh, degrees of life within the yep. Catch Strike community. So <laughs> we're going to explore some of the the other aspects because Nato Safix here is someone who, first of all, you might know because he did shamelessly self-promote himself in a in a positive way, though. Like, that's why I knew, knew about you initially because you were on Reddit anytime a clip would be posted. You've, I've, I've even seen you post stuff yourself, letting people know who you are. So you were playing in sort of like, at this time, it would be like the tier three scene. And then you were doing some commentary for, again, smaller tournaments online and streaming, etc. And now, more recently, people might know it because you actually got to play in Heroic, who... As, as people might have noticed if they followed any of the big tournaments. Uh, the interesting thing about the Heroic team, we'll talk about in a second, is you haven't had any, like, massive placing. Like, you haven't made, like, top four at a massive event or something. But you've actually had the upsets that would normally accompany a placing like that. Like, you've had a few massive upsets. So, like, Nato, ta- start us off in that sense. Like, where do you see yourself within? Like, where's Heroic for you? Because right? obviously the, those whole tiers... Half the problem with them is they're so vague as they are, you know. Like half of them, I notice people almost use just as a respect thing. Like, like they don't want you to say, for example, like G two isn't tier one because they look like a good team. But if you actually look how many teams they'd be fitting in tier one, it's like, I'm, what we're gonna fucking fucking twenty teams in tier one? Like, what's the point in tiers if there's twenty teams? You know, so it's, I know that's obviously very tenuous. Anyway, where do you see yourself at the moment in the scene? Where where would you describe yourself? <clears throat> I think actually where we are right now is a pretty like. Pretty pretty good spot for us. Um, like right now we're thirteenth, and that will surely change after the major because we won't be getting any points since we won't be attending. Um, but I see us as a team that's on the rise. Ever since I joined, I think we started at like twenty eighth or something like that. Started qualifying to pretty much everything we've played uh, except for obviously the minor, and then also we actually missed out on the Chicago spot, but got through on a uh, like. Yeah, a bit of a bullshit reason, I guess. But uh, the other team couldn't uh, get visas in time. So we attended all those events and, and we've been doing uh, Were really they Eastern well. European by any chance? Yeah, they were. Um, there we go. <laughs> right, there you go. Yeah. See, that's the one thing, Moses. Luckily, because, I mean, maybe we'll talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, one of the things that makes the <laughs> European scene very tough at the moment is you have a bunch of Eastern European teams, notably Foz, Avanga, who, if you meet them in an online qualifier, these motherfuckers are the Grim Reaper. Like, they will just end even really good teams. But the, the, way, the way it gets balanced out by life is about a solid 30% of the time, they'll never be able to event, attend the event anyway. So, problem solved. So. <laughs> that's the trend. That's yeah, the trend they make for Exactly, the yeah. Exactly. But honestly, that's so sad, right? Because they, they beat is. us in the Chicago qualifier, and they obviously deserve the win. Um but then they play the New York qualifier and they lose in the final. And I'm fairly certain they did get visas, just not in time for right. Chicago. So they would have actually been able to attend ESL1 New York, but then they didn't uh, win the final. So They probably yeah, had that in the back of their minds. They were like, look, boys, it's yeah. all right. As long as we win this match, the visas count still. They were like, oh, shit, pressure. Oh, no. <laughs> Fuck. And, and all they could uh, hear in their headsets the whole time, lose yourself in the moment. You got to know. <laughs> that, that would have to be the worst feeling to lose. Oh, that of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but actually, we were like, I mean, I'm going to have to be honest, right? Uh, the first thing that was said on TeamSpeak after we lost the Chicago qualifier was, yeah, guys, I mean, it's not that big of an issue. They they probably won't get visas in time. Uh, and I know some of the players already Cynicism. had it in their heads. Exactly, Moses. Yeah, they had it in their heads already before we played the game. It's like pretty crazy. I mean, I think it's not I mean, it's not really a bad thing, I guess, uh, necessarily, but we ended up losing the match and they ended up being right. So, yeah, uh, I guess 
that's that also is like an experience thing. I would have never even had that thought, you know. And then you guys went to Chicago off the back of that technicality, and you beat Vitality two zero in the group in the group stage. I believe pretty legit. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That was not bad. I mean. I think also Saibu had his like career worst uh, LAN map uh, versus us on Nuke, but I think it was actually I can't really remember the scoreline exactly, but I felt it was uh, not a dominant win, not like we completely destroyed them, but we were for sure the better team. Uh, we deserved that win and and we fought hard for it. What sucked was then that we had to face up against you know ends in the next, and they also a pretty good team ended up being like. Uh, a 2-0 to them, but it was 16-13, 16-14. And yeah, then we faced off against Vitality again. Took them to three maps, which I think is also still a really, really good result, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, very impressive. Um, but yeah, well, we couldn't make it into playoffs. Once again, we, we miss out in the last game. That really sucks, but yeah, I don't know. It, it will come with experience. It seems like the more time we have together, the, the better we're playing. Um, so yeah, I mean, right now we're 13th in the world. It will change for sure during the major, but... I think we have the potential to go top 10. And um, yeah, uh, we're working so much. Like, we're working so hard all the time. So. By the way, um, since, you, as you said, you didn't qualify for the major because you would have had to go through the online qualifier to get to the minor. And, and yeah. put it this way, luckily now, what's actually made it more forgivable to not make the minor now is people followed Nip all those years where they kept failing the online qualifier. So people now understand that the online qualifier is no joke. Like the teams you mm. lost to was the crazy team who actually ended yeah. up qualifying to the major. And then yep. this no chance team, which if you mm. if anyone knows this lineup, it's basically people, Everyone knows all these players. They're all rejects, though. It's like Crystal, yeah. Makaleli, Zen. Yeah. Who the fuck else was it? Steekles, even in there. Yeah, yeah it's, there's low, it's all play- And then there's a UK player, even in there, who actually's not oh, a yeah, yeah, player, Thomas, but yeah. he's he just never be- he's the only one who's never been to him, basically. So, yeah. what, what happened in this match? How did you lose to these guys? This, this is the one that's the more ridiculous one, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, personally, as I remember it, I had a like a huge off game. Um, I think I wrote it on Twitter as well, and I still have that feeling. It was the worst best of three I've ever played in my career. Um, I honestly don't know what happened. Uh, I wouldn't say pressure got to me, but I was still sort of new uh, in the team, and I hadn't found a place yet. Like We didn't have that much time to practice uh, because we had to attend... ESL uh, Pro League um, stage one, and then we just like we had some some qualifiers and all that. Um, so I think with a bit more time, I would have been able to perform better. But it was actually after the no chance game that the team came to me and they said that they would like to try another orper or at least like another guy in the orping role. Fucking and- hell! Wait, wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Yeah. Wait a minute! That's like your girlfriend coming in, like. I really love you and I like where this relationship's going, but <laughs> I think that, like, you know, we should be able to see other people as well. It's like, so you just want to fuck someone else. Like, what's this conversation? <laughs> what, you and just sat back like, oh, intro- uh, well, I'll let him finish. No, uh, I mean, see where they're no, going with this one. It wasn't right <laughs> after the, after the right? game, right? It, okay. was, it was a few days later. We, I think we had some, like, we went to the um, heroic offices in Copenhagen and um, then, I mean, obviously when we lost, uh, we immediately went home. Uh, then a few days after, I think it was, they, they wrote to me that if I would be up for it, they would like to test Isatek as an opera because he has been wanting to play op for a long time. And, and you know, being a new guy in the team, like I have, I had probably some, or I, I did for sure have some like personal uh, stuff in, in my life that now has uh, been resolved. Um, so that I had that in mind, right? Not to use it as an excuse or anything, but I was also uh, the new guy on the team and I felt. Um, something that I haven't actually felt in any other team, not when I joined Sprout, really. Like I feel there was so much pressure on exactly me, like it's exactly the op role because it's you know one of those uh, sort of say star player roles, right? So uh, yeah. they came to me and said, "Would you be up for doing it?" And I mean, in the end, what I want to do is just win, right? So I don't care if I'm playing like all the bitch roles. I don't care if I'm playing the star player role, as long as I am, you know making sure that the team is winning, then I feel like I'm doing my job. And when they came to me, at the beginning, you know, it was like a punch in the stomach, but I, I sat with it and I talked to the coach and I talked to the in-game leader and stuff. And, um, you know, I realized that they weren't doing it to harm me. It wasn't to try to push me out of the team or something. It was just the fact that it seemed like it wasn't quite working. It would give me some more time to fit into the team um, and like get more experience versus uh, some of these like top teams which we were playing all the time, and then uh, it was always like said that 
we could potentially be switching back at some point. Um, so it, I mean, at the start, I, I took it bad, right? But um, it ended up being really nice. Um, I think they honestly did me a favor. It's easy to become the scapegoat then when you get like sort of say all the bitch roles and you're not used to and not very comfortable in those roles. But I mean, the team is winning. Um, sure. And I mean, <laughs> then I don't care, uh, you know, what else happens as long as I am a part of the team and we're winning. I'm Here's the happy. thing. You've nailed it, Nato, on two levels or that, that people need the mentality of if they're going to do what you're doing. It's just that it takes actually a lot of pros, a long time of experience and going through community backlash before they get... I always tell them two things. So, for example, Taco is a great example of someone I always used to say this to. I used to say to him, mate, don't bother getting caught up in whether or not you're getting enough credit, whatever the fuck that actually means, from the community. Usually it just means you want some attention, you know, you want some people to say you did a good job, you want people to probably put you on some sort of a list, you know, if you've won all the championships, you think, why are I on a list? Why are I considered a top player? But I told him, mate, the type of role you're playing in that team, your credit is when you get to have the trophy. Like at the end of the day, I said, it, think of it this way, right? Simple could play better than everyone in the tournament and not win the trophy, right? So his credit is that people then go on and on about what a great player he is and put him on a list. And, you know, that's almost like some sort of fucked up consolation prize that we say, right, well, you couldn't win the tournament, but you, we're going to say you're the best anyway, even though our entire field is pure competition and you didn't actually win in the competition. So that's kind of like a fucked up thing we just do to make people like that, not just go mental and kill everyone because the teammates are so <laughs> terrible. Like in scenario of something like Taco, it's like, mate, you, if this was a 1v1 spot, you'd never win anything, would you? So just take the fact that like in your team, the way you get to succeed is through helping your team. And if you help your team, you win all the tr trophies. Like that's actually, and then the other part is, this is the part I often tell people. So people hate to play the roles that, like you say, don't get credit and are sort of invisible roles because half the time when you do something good in that role, it makes someone else shine in the team. You won't actually be the one who shines half the time. So what I always tell people is, in that scenario, th there's actually a mindset you can have that makes that a really fun role to play. So I'll give you an example. Anyone who's ever played a MOBA game, League of Legends, Dota 2, right? It sucks to play the support roles because what happens is you're the guy with the least gold and the least items and you can do the least damage to people and it's viewed as a role that's the least important so what people think right who play the other roles is i'll still win the game even if, as long as this guy does an okay job i'll win the game it's like that's exactly why you can actually be very confident if you play those roles because what i always thought i love to play the support role in those games is this is brilliant if this is a role that's considered not that important and other players are going to not be very good at it i can actually have a massive impact on this game if i mad outperform the other support player like if i do my job really really well and theirs does a terrible job at the end of the game the play the guy who's the carry won't notice he's just doing whatever the fuck he's doing but i actually might be the reason we won the game like if their support has <laughs> It's just way worse, doesn't know how to work with his teammate. Like, I think I think those mental aspects, they don't change what you do in the role, but how you see yourself in the role, it's, it's a massive difference. It takes it takes a special kind of mentality in a player to, to really commit to those roles, though. It's sure. also the reason why we don't have a whole lot of new in-game leaders like you know coming up. It's why you don't see those those new in-game leaders because they don't you don't really see their value until you get to the very top of Counter-Strike. Like an in-game leader in main, it's tough to distinguish yourself, especially if the players around you aren't as good or aren't as willing. So that those those mentalities are really hard hard to come by, and they're always super super valuable in teams. Yeah, I mean, in, in the end, the way I see it, the the mentality that I've decided to choose is, I don't care about impressing anyone. Like, I don't care about. Obviously, I want to impress my parents. Don't get me wrong, but like, that's not that's not why I'm playing the game. I don't play to impress the community. I don't play to impress <laughs> anyone. There's okay. only a, a handful of people who I actually play to impress, and that's my teammates. Because I know if my teammates think I'm doing a good job, then I'm staying on that team. And eventually, I mean, if that team continues winning or starts winning, I will be a part of that team for a long time. So my only focus is to, I wouldn't say play in a way so that my teammates are happy, but it sort of is. So I'm the type of guy who will be there on the team speak, hyping up people. When things go bad, like what I would be the one to say is, fuck that guys we're gonna you know it doesn't matter just keep your focus in the game we're gonna win the next round right it's the same way right now i have a i have a more supportive role than i've probably had ever before in my career and at this current point in time my only goal is to just make sure that my teammates are happy and that they you know that they are able to see past the you know stats on hltv because if they agree that or at least as long as they think that i'm doing a good job 
then you know I have nothing to worry about, and sure. yeah, that's the goal. How have you uh, how have you handled this transition into like more of a supportive role? Like, what have you what, what's been the difficult obstacles for you to overcome as you as you get deeper and deeper into like playing a more passive support style? Well, I think just in general, obviously switching from AWP to rifle is different. Um, I have been playing rifle in the past uh, in other teams. I was actually playing rifle agile in in some of my early teams. Um, so I feel like I've got the level to 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 play the rifle. Um, but for me, it's like way different to go from an AWP player to, let's say, just take Inferno as an example, right? As the AWP player, I might be mostly holding mid, but I'll also be taking some peaks towards B. And I'll very often be supporting B, right? But as an AWP player, I will never be supporting the two players playing apps. Like the only way that will happen is if it's like an apps explode and it's like a set tactic and I'll be flashing them out. So my entire like experience, game knowledge, all that shit, like it's built on the mid and banana area. Like the all basically doesn't go into apps. So having to now play, you know, apps at the beginning, I was playing boiler, then me and uh, Stown switched roles. So now I'm playing apps and it's just like, it's completely different. So what I've had to do is I've had to obviously watch quite a few demos of some of the better players. I've been asking my teammates um, what they usually do in that specific role. Like, do they have any fancy tricks I should learn? Um, they typically have a better understanding of that role than I do, simply because they've been playing close up to that role or even been playing that role in past teams. So, I mean, I'm just taking anything I can get. Um, in the end, what I'm trying to do is play off intuition, right? Because I don't have the experience to back it up. But there are games where I feel like I'm sort of, I wouldn't say useless, but that's kind of the feeling I'm getting because I exactly don't have the experience to back it up. And that's something that I'm only going to get, obviously, by playing these top teams on LAN. Um, I think I'm always doing like a good job at keeping the mood up, keeping everyone happy, throwing my grenades correctly and stuff. But you know, capitalizing on that time gap or something like that, um, putting in that sense the pressure on you when you're in a role where you're maybe not so used to it or that comfortable. I think that's really hard, especially when you are playing these, you know, games to go to playoffs. Um, but I think there's something that changed, like uh, right before Chicago, and I think. I haven't checked the stats because that's not really something that I do, but I, at least my feeling was that for once I was actually myself on the server in Heroic. I felt like I was playing a really good tournament. And um, yeah, I, I think I only had one bad map and that was, um, I think, the Mirage versus Vitality. I think all of the maps I, I, I performed pretty, pretty well. Um, so I am adjusting. I am getting better. And yeah, hopefully like... <laughs> I'll, I'll continue to do so um, as long as I get the time because sure. that's in the end all that like that's if I don't get the time there won't be any opportunity right so one of the things I thought we would talk about in this episode just because it's your background so you can have insight for us is, is like some of the players in the Danish scene that have come up the last couple of years because obviously a lot of them were playing it around the level you were at so one of the players actually I want to ask about I mean you didn't play with him but it's the player you actually replaced in Heroic which is Mertz so if people remember, you go back in time, it was around a, just around a year, actually, I think that he got bent, well, a little bit, a little bit more than that, maybe that he got benched from North, he's playing in North for a little while, then he came over to Heroic for a while, and now, as far as we can tell, he seems like he's in the wilderness at this point in time. What did, what do you think of him as a player? Um, what do you, what do you think his issues were? Because he was clearly someone who had some talent, but I, it, it also had seemingly in the teams he was in, they couldn't, want for whatever reason, shape him into the player they wanted or he didn't fit or something. What do you think of this player? Well, it must be a I bit mean, of a rival of yours, right? If you think of the timing of when he came up in the scene, <laughs> both Orpers. Yeah, and he completely overtook me. I mean, I, I couldn't keep up with the guy. He was like, you know, putting up insane numbers every time we played each other, basically. Uh, everyone thought he was a phenomenal player. He's got like one of those personalities that fit really well in Counter-Strike. Like he's... Um, yeah, he's just like a bit more. Uh, I mean, don't he's I don't want to. Pretty charismatic guy, from what I could tell. Yeah, a, like a pretty he's, charismatic he's guy, but he's also like uh, I've lead, at least heard other people in the Danish scene like uh, you know not being picked up to, into teams because they were awkward, for example. Right, sure. Where he had like a very um, 
uh, extroverted personality, you know, like he, he was always outgoing, like talking to people and stuff like that. And he's one of those guys where when you talk to him, he just makes you like feel good about yourself. You know, you, you sure. feel like you're a part of the group. So in that way, he's like perfect uh, for something like Counter-Strike, in my opinion. But as a player, I mean, um, a- as you said, I haven't played with him. Uh, obviously, I've I've heard some things, and I I can also assume some things. But at least the reason why I think it didn't work out exactly how they wanted it to in heroic was that uh, the way I see heroic right now, with how the roles are, you have like Blame F, who is you know he really wants to be a star player. Like he wants to be the guy with the pressure. He wants to be the guy who's clutching, you know, getting sure. uh, the highlights and stuff. And I mean, uh, a lot of respect to that. That's also a really really nice thing to have in a team. Then you have like. Stown, who also would like to be a star player, of course, but he's in some of the more quiet roles. But he's definitely like a second star. If I, I mean, I'm gonna just uh, you know steal your system here, Thor. Right, mate. The star and right. Everything right. Because, Everyone uh, does. They just don't yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Jesus. And then, I, I mean, I've heard uh, you know some some really clever guys say that every team needs a third star, and. Um, uh, to me, that is like you know, is a take. Um, I think he's like super underrated player. He he does more than just the stuff he does on the server. Which star and, is Freiburg? Yeah, but that's the thing, right? The old because, star. <laughs> yeah, but but I mean, it's it's to a point where I would even call myself the the fifth star. I, mean, I don't think you even get a star anymore. But like Freiburg, he's just a reliable player and. Sometimes it happened versus Vitality at Chicago. He just pops off and then wins us maps single-handedly. So it's like, I think the reason why it worked so well was because before they had, you know, Blame If, who wants to be the star, Stown, who is at least like really fit to be a star. I'm not sure if he's like wanting it as much as maybe Blame If. But then you have Isitek, who is for sure good enough to be a star on, yeah, I would say most <coughs> teams in the world. And then you also had a Mertz who is... Also known to, you know, not be the most supportive player. Uh, sure. He also wants to be a star player. He he's always putting up the numbers, right? And that's what he does best. But the the problem I think was that there were too many stars on one team, and that's what I've you know joined to balance because I've always always even when I have sort of been the star player in my past teams, it's I've always been like a supportive orb player, like winning the clutches, you know. Um, I haven't been the super aggressive, you know, entry fragging style orpa. And I think that's why it's way more balanced now because I am more, I guess, uh, used to thinking, how can I set up my teammates? Whereas for Mertz, um, without it being a bad thing at all, he was probably more focused on how can I set up myself because he thought that that was how he was going to be the most impactful for his team. The problem is when you have too many of those types of players, then you end up with a team that's dysfunctional. And without even, I mean, sometimes I even stop to think like, <laughs> at least at the beginning, I, I had a hard time finding out what I, I was even doing on the team because I felt like I wasn't really providing what I could. You know, I, I felt like I was doing less than 50% of what I was capable of. But now I realize that I'm, you know, in some ways a missing puzzle piece. I, I'm the guy who's like, gluing everything together I'm, I'm making sure that everyone is happy i'm setting up the stars um i'm taking you know the 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 shit roles when they need to be taken and sure. honestly that's how you make a proper team you can see it on navi as well i know you you bring them up a lot as well thorin because you know you have simple world's best player and yet you have a team that isn't winning but for me you have you know simple and electronic as the second star which is pretty obvious then you have the the flamey who can also sometimes have a a great great game right and now you have Boomich, who i think is actually also looking really really good and then you have Zeus. but for me i mean Zeus is not dead weight in any way like that's a guy you need on a team for your stars to be able to put up the numbers that they are and for sure if you had a an igo maybe even like Boomich, someone in the cis re- region <clears throat> could be like a guy like james as well i mean he's an opera but uh, you get the point it would be impossible for simple electronic these players to put up the numbers because i mean there's just there's not there's only a set amount of frags in every game right um so the reason they shine brighter than most other players is partly because of their talent but partly because you have players who are willing to stay in the shadows and actually set up their teammates for success and do I, you I have that's a really good do you have a like a top three of like the players who play these like supportive like glue, glue roles that you're talking about that are so important? Do you have like a list in your head of like your favorite three players to watch? 
No, because I think it's quite hard with these like supportive glue uh, players because it's really hard to to judge their impact when you're not on the team speak. I mean, you you could have a, a player who just has bad stats and he's just a bad player. You could also have a player who has bad stats and that's because, you know, he's the first guy jumping through the smoke every time. He's the, you know, and, and and it's not like, I don't think it should ever be used as an excuse to have bad stats. Like it shouldn't be like, okay, I have bad stats. That must be because I'm like taking sure. a support role. And in the same way, I mean, I don't want to come across as a guy that's saying like, yeah, I'm just, uh, you know, leaning back in my chair. I'm not, <laughs> trying hard because I, I'm just a support player or something like that. I mean, I try every single day to be the best version of myself but with these like supportive style players the way you can measure their impact is is the team winning. And for me, even though Navi is not obviously the best team in the world, they've been up there for the longest time. You had Zeus on Gambit. I was there watching the Krakow Major from the arena when Gambit won and it was like a huge upset and everyone from that team went out and said Zeus had like a huge impact. And you could see it even in the tactical pauses. You could see it when they played. Like he was a commanding leader and they all believed in him and I don't know, it's that's some hidden value with these players. Um it's it's hard to know how big that impact is without being on the team speak. But that's why if you're only looking to impress your teammates, then that's you know that hidden value that only gets shown to those guys that you want to impress. Sure. By the way, as a quick aside, I'll give you a little piece of info here that no one's ever actually been told. I've intimated as much on some talk shows before. But actually, when Gambit had the break after they won that major, where Zeus out of nowhere just went back to Na'Vi, and there was the whole drama behind the scenes of like, where it was claimed it's because Gambit wanted to kick Kane, who was his friend, who's now the coach of Na'Vi as well. And there was the whole thing with that. Because it ended in, like in English, you'd say acrimonious. Like it was not a good ending for everyone. Like they clearly didn't like each other and they kind of parted ways on bad terms. What's funny is, basically, some of the Gambit players kind of put it out there in the scene after that tournament that like, oh, everyone was overrating Zeus, you know, he wasn't even making half these calls and, you know, like it was, uh, some of them were even being like, it was me, I made that call, I made the fucking game winning call. Like, they were doing all this, right? But all you need to know is this, if that's true and they think Zeus was just dead weight, you all had your turn to be the IGL afterwards in Gambit. Didn't didn't go so well if you were making all these sick calls, did it, boys? Meanwhile, it's not like Zeus hasn't had his own problems. He has his own issues. I think actually, if I think if you look when he first came back to Na'Vi, he looked a bit lost at sea for the first three or four months. It took him a while to get that team back to a top level. So I would go ahead and as usual, if you've been around the scene, just see that as like just a bit of sour grips from both parties. And in reality, yeah. I'd imagine they both did something. Like I'd imagine Zeus probably did a good job in his own regards. Probably we didn't do all of it which is why they're getting mad and I'd imagine some of them probably made some good calls think of some of the names they had in that team some veteran players like well, it's probably I, both I imagine too if you went back and asked Adren that question now I imagine he would probably admit that Zeus had a lot more impact than he, than he probably said right after the major you know sure. or, or whoever it was on Gambit just because as time passes you, you look a little bit more reasonably uh, back on the path not to get too you got to get some distance. No, but you do. You have to get distance yeah. to before you can really like divide up who's credit you, was. Did you stuff. read uh, Automatic's article that that he wrote? Um, I saw some of it. Yeah, that was. I mean, he was super introspective looking back on his time, like around winning the major and everything, and and that that felt very honest. You know, two years two years removed from it, so um, that was sweet, or a year removed from it. Excuse me. Indeed. Right, what about this then? So one thing I wanted to ask about was, um, so you were, there was actually a tweet along these lines, which is what made me think to do this podcast, was when I said that at ESL One Cologne, there was actually a lot of people, and by the way, I'll tell people right now, a lot of people who were like talent or pros attending the event who behind the scenes thought Astralis was going to win this event. Like it wasn't just like they were like, they're going to be good again. No, there was like, there was top pros and teams just telling me, yeah, they're going to win like from scrims, you know, like they're, they're back boys. Like they're fully back in form. Like they've, they've warmed up. Obviously I don't even need to tell you which talent members were. The motherfuckers were on camera 24 seven predicting them. So <laughs> you know, some of them, you know, keep your eye on them. So, like, what I'm going to say is this. Not really. I was not I in that. I was you weren't, Moses. I'll give you. I'll take. I'll give you credit on that one. You weren't. <laughs> Whereas I did literally tell everyone Vitality would outplay some. So you know, oh fucking hell, he's only accidentally got it. But anyway, whatever. You know how I do my shit. Yeah, so the point is, 
The point is, like, the whole reason I personally wasn't anywhere is because even if I granted the premise, Nato, that in scrims they were really sick and they were back to form, etc., I've just known too much about Counter Strike. Like, until I see it in the server, I don't believe it. Like, you have to show me, you know, there's too many stories like that at every event of one team that's supposed to be super hot or is unbeatable. That the amount of times it doesn't happen in the in the tournament is, is unbelievable. It's most times basically, right? And you actually said in in on Twitter that at least from the scrims you guys had played against them, that actually you hadn't even. Saw it seen that so like to you guys they weren't tearing it up in scrims so what, what would you have to say on this topic generally well i mean i've i've now played uh most of the recent top teams right because obviously sure. we we practice a lot we we don't play liquid as much because it's generally only if we attend events uh, at the same time or if they are in europe right um so it's like uh for me you know when you play liquid uh, you see that they're just a good team. Like, um, obviously, they're better than just good. But it's not like there's anything specific where you're thinking. Um, I, I know that it's, in, it's been highlighted a lot that they might be the, the most individually, like, impressive team ever to grace Counter-Strike, right? Sure. Um, I haven't played them in an official, so I wouldn't know. But for me, at least, with Astralis, what was, you know, what made them better than any other team and this is somewhat obvious um but it was it was the grenade usage it was their team play and when you play a team like liquid in scrims or something like that i feel like you don't get that feeling that you're just being completely you know outplayed whereas with astralis it was always like they had this also in incredible individual skill level and then they would just be throwing better flashes than any other team and it was like not even close, you know. You would always, if you go, if you went out from a corner, you would get blind. If you like, they would always, always peek with a flash and stuff like that. They used their grenades so, so well. Um, they were obviously also the ones to, you know, bring this like triple nade uh, meta to the game and stuff. And when um, I'm not entirely sure when the change uh, happened, but at least when I joined Heroic, we we played them quite a bit, and. Even though I was new in the team, and obviously this was practice results, so it, it, it doesn't hold that much weight, but I feel like we were, you know, playing uh, like we were, we were pretty even um, with them most of the time, and we were even beating them on maps where we it was our first practice together as a team on that specific map, and we were still like playing sixteen fourteen against them. Nice and, little confidence booster. First game yeah, on this yeah, map, exactly. oh, just beating the greatest team of all time. Yeah, yeah. So just yeah, think, boys, well, that's the warm up game. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so it was exactly like that, and I think uh, actually that map was Mirage, and we also had some incredible results on Mirage at the beginning of Heroic, but. Um, the thing, like the thing for me at least, was you could still feel that they were, you know, individually good. Uh, they still had the crazy good flashes and like the utility usage on this, but they just did not like, you know, win a, a one on three like you would see in a liquid or even in a lot of other teams where you have these players that are, especially if you look at like let's say top ten to twenty, right? You sure. have a lot of um, players that are maybe even too good for their level. And so they could just pop off and win a random round sometimes. Sure. Um, but with Astralis, it's like, you know, they could obviously do it at any level. And that's also why, you know, the Liquid players are so good. But um, the thing for me, it was that they kind of lacked that, even versus us. Even though we were a new team, they still had the the, 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 the groundwork, you know, like... Um, they still had the the strats. They still had the amazing flashbangs, the teamwork, and all this. But individually, it just felt like they lost the confidence, you know. Because I think I I haven't been there, and I, I don't think any of you have played in a like uh, you know team with an era. Um, but but I would assume that that gives well, you some. <laughs> the thing yeah? is, no, no, not at all. No. <laughs> no, but like for me, I would imagine that being the number one, like the undisputed king of Counter Strike, would give you. A next level of confidence, right? Sure. I think it was Twists that said it as well. Was it on PA for Pro League Finals where he said that they actually played pretty bad versus Energy? Like they they played without teamwork, but they managed to win on individual skill. And I think sure. Energy were top five in the world at that time. Sure, <laughs> you can only do that if you have like some next level confidence. Where I mean, you just expect that you kill everyone, right? And Astralis had that when they were the undisputed number one, but it seemed like when they stopped attending tournaments, they lost that um, that confidence because they weren't anymore the undisputed number one. And it was not the confidence in you know the 
yeah, like in the basics, in their fundamentals. It was just the the confidence, I guess, in their own individual ability. Um, I'm not saying that they were thinking, oh my God, I'm so bad. But they had the like confidence that just meant if they were in a one on three, they would every time think, I'm going to win it, you know? So that's I why think it goes both ways as well, mate. Because the thing is, not only do you yourself think, because everything, let's face it, everything in Strauss was like almost perfect. Like the team was perfect, yeah. the maps were all perfect. So, so as a, and everyone, everyone's form, you can even check the stats. Everyone's form was inflated. Every single player was at like pretty much career best levels of form. So <laughs> when everything goes right, it means that like it's not even just individual conference. Like even if you're dead, well, I know this guy's going to win the one v two. Oh, these guys are in two v five. I'll probably win it anyway. And on top of that, even if they don't, well, we've got. The the best strats anyway we'll probably win the gun round next to that if we lose this map we win the map after that you can see how like it would be beyond contagious like in every area of the game you're just getting told by the world like everything you do works everything you do is right and and the opponent's got to deal with he knows that that's the case as well like he's knowing even if i killed this person like like the di- here's the difference i'll give people that might sound counterintuitive you if you were a normal player who hasn't played in a pro team it might seem more intimidating to play against Team Liquid, because Team Liquid, their players can be in a bad situation and then one of them just shoots everyone in the head and they win the round, right? That might feel like, oh, that'd be so bullshit to play against. No, because believe it or not, in that scenario, I can at least take comfort in like, well, we're putting them in bad spots. Like, as long as we keep doing this, they can't win all of them. Eventually, we're gonna. The, I think Astralis is way more like demoralizing to play against because the amount of times I would see in the Astralis era that a round would start to develop, right? That should eventually end in a normal 1v1 and you get a little bit of excitement excitement and who wins the 1v1 and it never got to a 1v1 because they just did like a perfect crossfire or they peaked with a great timing or someone did a flash for the other guy and they just killed the other guy and you and if it's a viewer you almost felt like fuck didn't even get ready to watch anything there like where, where was the excitement from like they were always going to win that like that's way more demoralizing because if you're that player you're just like well, what was i supposed to do they perfectly peaked the angle or they flashed me off like i there was nothing i could actually do that's that to me that feels way more demoralizing yeah i i have to agree yeah completely like, it definitely is um but the, that individual skill as well i mean it, it is demoralizing to a certain degree where you're just it's the same kind of feeling it's just i think i think the hopelessness comes in because you feel like you have no chance like if you if you keep putting liquid in that position like you said duncan like you're just constantly saying eventually you know we're going to play this perfect or eventually we're not going to make a mistake and the crossfire is going to work out and that's that's the position you always want to be in sure yeah yeah and and for me as well like you know, it's probably doesn't come as a surprise, but I was a pretty big fan of Astralis um, already before their era because obviously I'm Danish and they have always been the best team in Denmark. Um, but for me, it got to a point where I was getting so frustrated. Like, there's no point in even watching these events anymore because they always would win and it would always be in such convincing fashion that, like, even though it was obviously beautiful, Counter Strike <coughs> did everything perfectly, it was just not exciting to watch. At least not for me. And with Liquid, now they've, for example, won the Intel Grand Slam, right, in record time. And yet it's like I'm not really getting bored of watching them, if that makes sense. Sure. Uh, the era hasn't been as long, of course, but but still it's – I feel like it's still refreshing because we actually get to see these one-on-threes, these one-on-fours. Um, I would like Counter-Strike to get back to a place kind of like – I think it was – maybe late 2014, start of 2015, where you had like four teams that were all, you know, legit champion contenders and could fight for the title. Um, but yeah, it's been a while now since we've had that. And yeah, I hope we get it back. There seems, there seems to be like a rotating top team at the moment. I don't I don't know what's caused that as well, where there's just like one dominant team and then everyone trying to play catch up. I think that's that's super interesting because I, I agree. I don't, I don't know when we, we've kind of gone away from the idea that there were two or three teams that could win every single event. And at the moment, it just seems, again, everyone's playing catch-up to Liquid. Just six or just last year, was everyone playing catch-up to Astralis. I don't know why. Is there a reason, do you think, why it's so top-heavy with just one team? Like, do you notice anything in practice why, like, teams just aren't making the proper leaps or the proper improvements over time? No, I, I can't really point to anything specific, but I think it's right now even worse than it was when Astralis was there because... At least when Astralis was there, you had like teams all the way down the rankings that were pretty solid, right? And with how it is right now, I think there's even teams in the top 20 where I'm thinking, I mean, they might be good, but I don't know if... It, I wouldn't say they're not worthy of being a top 20 team, right? But at least for me, it used to be even, uh, you know, uh, Avangar 
they used to be like a pretty solid uh, top 20 team, and now they've like completely dropped off. Uh, it seems like they're not getting the same results at all, even though they're trying to, you know, shake up their roster and everything. And I, I feel like we're also missing something just down the ladder. It's like right now you have one really, really good team, but even, you know, you have like maybe your Vitality and Astralis, but besides that, it's like there's even we're even lacking like a, a solid middle. Um, it's like we have like the, the top, top, top teams and then you have like, yeah, lower tier teams. And I guess that's something that benefits us as well. That's why we are able to upset a lot of these teams. I mean, graded, we, we did beat um, some of the teams that I did just mention. I think that are proper top teams right now, like Inns Vitality, I think they're pretty solid. Um, but I feel like even the teams, even your NIPs, your Fnatics and stuff, they, they are far from unbeatable. Whereas before, sure. I felt like top 10 teams, you know, you, you they were almost untouchable if you were outside the top 10. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that makes me not lose hope in this scenario, though, is like, if you notice, one of the interesting things whenever one team is really dominant is it just accelerates how quickly the teams that are competing with them but losing all the time are more likely to make a roster change. So if you actually look at the teams just below Team Liquid, there are literally like obvious on paper moves could potentially make these teams more interesting. Like the obvious one is if Ents doesn't get to championship form, sooner or later they're going to pull that trigger and get Sunny into the team, assuming they can. Like the idea they wouldn't on their end, that's like an inevitable move. I even give you another one is either Astralis gets really good or eventually they'll think about a move. Like we all know Valdez just sat out there. He's the most obvious person to pick up. There's no like social reason you wouldn't. He's played so many different roles. That's if you even need to. Obviously that team could still potentially get back with these five. Vitality, I mean, it goes without saying the French scene still has more talent. Keo, the G2 players, they just for whatever reason in terms of like business aren't in a position where they've been ready to do that and they only just got to the top so they're still like feeling out, you know. I think Na'Vi, we just haven't even seen him enough. We've only seen him at one tournament. So I'm not even writing that move off. Like the boom, which one looked pretty interesting as a move. I thought that might be give them a little bit more versatility as a team. I could see that affecting things. Then you've got the squads like NRG still only just did the Stanislaw move. There's actually, there's a few either moves or moves that have already happened that I could still see three months down the line that making the scene super interesting at the top. Like just because Team Liquid wins everything now, like, I don't think that that means that like you have to give up hope, like that the scene's just fucked for the rest of the year or whatever. I still think there's, there's a big possibility for competition. Well, that's what makes them the more exciting top team to watch than Astralis was, is because when you watch Liquid play, like they have really close games. Like they have to make a lot of comebacks and they have to win at least one of those miracle one versus three to somehow stay in the game. And that's super exciting stuff. I think Astralis certainly was the more efficient of these two eras that we've that we've experienced, you know, previously, or these two these two streaks from these two teams. I actually think of Astralis is in some ways was was way more impressive with how comprehensive it was in terms of the teamwork that was utilized. Liquid feels very beatable, even as a team who has never hasn't lost a tournament in terms of sure. individual maps. They feel beatable. I also think as well, the difference between the two teams is like in Liquid, let's face it, these players have to frag. Like there's just the way it's like the horse they rode in on, it's the one that's going to take them as far as it's going to take them. The difference, well, another thing I would find demoralizing if you play in classic Astralis is you actually did feel like players didn't always have to go off. Like just the system could beat you. Like they were going to yeah. give themselves chances to grind out games when they should actually have lost them. Like I know on paper, it might look like they won that map 16-9 and so they were just smashing everyone. But if you go back, some of those games, I'll bet with a sort of game where if you don't win a few key rounds that suddenly that's like you're the one who's facing down like a fucking 9 to 13 scoreline the other way you know and you, you, you're thinking because remember that's the thing this is the thing that I, I always make this point but even I forget right the hardest thing about Counter-Strike is the scoreboard does lie like in reality I know with the, with the money change system now you get a lot more proper gun rounds but in the old money system especially like we always used to say in analysis there's maybe in reality six key rounds in a map and whoever gets the most of these six key rounds probably wins the map like a very high percentage of the time. You know, the round before you get money broke or the round that like builds you up to have full bank. Like there's a few key moments that the other rounds look like they're the same because the scoreboard changes by one round, but it's not the same. I always give the analogy. It's a bit like tennis, like the scoring system. It doesn't matter how close it is. You can dominate a game. If you just consistently win certain points in a match, you will win the match. It might look great on the scoreboard. Like, oh, it's so close. But you know you weren't if you were a competitor. But there's actually also a, another thing that I think is <laughs> could be looked at at least. I think uh, still uh, sometimes the pistol rounds they have too much to say. 
like every pistol round strat that you run is just a gamble. Like you can't, you always when you do the analysis, for example, you look at their maybe past three pistol rounds, and you just take a wild guess on what they're probably gonna do. Or maybe you have some insane pistol round strat that no one has ever seen that will win you the round with like eighty percent certainty. But it is, uh, you know, really really important to get that pistol round. And for example, for us in Chicago, I think after was it like. I think we won one out of eight pistols or something like that. I, I mean, it's not obviously. I'm not just saying this because it would, you know, benefit my team in that in that specific scenario. But it's like, I think the pistol rounds they they still hold too much value for how random they are. I don't know if we've ever talked about this, Moses, but I know, for example, like Henry's yeah. the most famous advocate. He, yeah, yeah. he actually wants pistol rounds completely taken away. What's your take on it? Yeah, are you asking me or him? <laughs> I meant Moses. Yeah, what, yeah. What, yeah. What, do you have a do you have a take? I, I don't remember if you've ever expressed one. Um, I I prefer pistol rounds, um, but not not. It's mostly for like the nostalgic sense of where it feels like Counter Strike. I mean, I I don't think I don't think pistol rounds have nearly the impact they now than they than they used to. And I'm actually I was actually surprised to hear you kind of say that, just because I think with the amount of times that we see teams when maybe it's not a second round, but some kind of a pistol force up or buy into the third round with this new money system and you can have a solid buy in the third round. I feel like the pistol round isn't, isn't all that important. I've been actually consciously trying to talk, talk less about like winning both pistols being such an important factor to victory because there's so many more buy rounds. Now you have so many more opportunities, so many more low economy weapons are impactful that you have so many chances to rebound from a pistol loss. Maybe not in the round after that or the round after that, but at some point across the course of those first 10 rounds, you can recover from a pistol round loss. I think there's plenty of opportunities and mechanisms to get out of it. Um, I don't. I don't really. I mean, I, I think I'd be intrigued to see what a, what a game would actually be like without pistol rounds, but I don't think it's necessary in any way. Okay. I wouldn't. I wouldn't remove it either. Like I, I like the pistol rounds. That's not the problem for me. It's just, and, and I do also agree with you, Moses, that the impact of them has like at least gotten uh, softened. It's lessened. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's lessened exactly after we got the new money system. Um, so it could also be, you know, we haven't even had that long. I, I'm not sure. Is it like three, four months, maybe two months? Oh, three, four five. months more, maybe even five. I'm not sure. Something like that. But it, it's it, for me, it hasn't been long enough that we have all, you know, the statistics and, and all the knowledge completely down. So um, I, I think it's still something that could be looked at simply because at least for me, when you have like a, a buy round, you know, you have you have something to I mean you, you have some tendencies you've seen, not just on the analysis, but you also have seen during the game, right? You can you can act accordingly to what your opponent is doing. Whereas pistol sure. rounds is always the first round and a half and you're just it's just random. I I mean and sometimes you can have teams that win absolutely no piss rounds, and in the next event they're winning all their piss rounds. And I don't believe that to be because they had better tactics or whatever. It's just I feel like they are sort of random. And just in yeah. general, like for me, the the less randomness, the better. Like the 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 better a win is, you know, it it sure. means that you are the better team. And that's also why you know at the beginning people talked a lot about also with the major system and everything, that there were too many best of ones. And now we mostly changed that, right? Because with more maps played, you get it's more likely that you're going to get the, the sort of say, right victor. Um, I at least think piss runs is, is like a place where you could perhaps um, change a thing or two. Uh, because I, for me, at least, they, they do feel kind of random and they at least used to hold a lot of weight. It'd be cool if you could tweak... Uh, I mean... Again, this would be messing with the economy, which I which I hate doing. So in some way, this suggestion is insane. But if you increase the amount of money so that pistorons can use like utility or something like that, but then you just start venturing into giving enough money to actually buy SMGs and drop them over and shit. So yeah, I mean, I don't think they're gonna I don't think they're gonna go anywhere. To be quite honest with you, but. I'm almost certain that's one change that will never happen. Like that's yeah. it's a bit like thinking you will ever change to like six v six or four v four. Like I don't think that's even in them the world view of the people who make the decisions. So I don't think that'll ever happen. Personally, yeah. like again, I'd have to say was I can't know what it would look like. So for all I know, yeah. it, this is one of the problems with like format changes as well. Is like until you actually see the format played out, like like when it, like when you first heard of Swiss system, it sounded amazing. It sounded like fucking hell, it sounds like the best thing ever. But then it has its own flaws as well you know that you run into you like actually that part sucks as you couldn't know it until i saw enough like runs through the system mm. so the problem i have is 
Like in general, I'd be in favor of trying a system with no pistol rounds because I would love the idea of you get X amount of rounds in a game. Sure, the money economy is still going to limit how many you're going to get in terms of full buys. But even from round one, you're coming in and if you're an IGL, here's the strat you're going to run and there's the strat you're trying to counter from the opponent and you start real Counter-Strike. Because one of the things I do find still to this day is unsatisfying about pistol rounds is it is the round that I feel like is the most overwhelmingly um, skewed by individual skill. Like, think about how many pistol rounds is just, like, Rain just shoots three people in the head with the USP. Now, yeah, sure, he could, in theory, do that with an AK, but it isn't the same. Like, people aren't just peeking him constantly with an AK on a corner till one of the two of them shoots each other in the head. Like, that's not the way you play out a real gun round. So, to me, like, like he says there, there's not... As much as there are pistol round strats, it's not the same. There's not the same strat no, book. There's not. not the same depth. Whereas I always tell people this. One of the things that makes Counter-Strike miraculous, I've never even figured out exactly how to explain it myself, is everyone knows when you play a game of Counter-Strike that in an individual round, there's massive amount of variance. All sorts of crazy things could happen. Let's say I'm, I'm on Dust 2 and I'm on the T side and I'm going to run up the catwalk. Like I'm going into A and we're going to do a split onto A. Right? At this point, when I run up, there could be a person immediately around the corner when I go catwalk and he kills me immediately there could be a person at the corner on catwalk there could be a person watching over the top there there could be someone behind a smoke like there's 50 million ways I could get shot by this person could have even right? been boosted in double doors there we go classic one and wow. and yet despite all of this despite all the variables if you run the, the same strat against teams and you call it the right round you can get an amazing amount of consistency despite the fact all these different things could go wrong the flash could go off wrong my teammate could come out slightly one second too late if you run the strat over and you lock a, a top team do it in let's say 50 demos you'll be amazed how often the same things happen and there's actually a flaw and it's logical and you can even as the team rely on that and as the opposing team you can counter that and actually make a, a clever read off it like even though there are these small random elements in counter-strike somehow the game itself almost doesn't make them too impactful like they don't they don't overwhelm the game and so we can feel like we are a game like american football with like real strats and a real meta game and people understand what their role is that's awesome so to me that's one reason i personally would be against the pistol rounds because i feel like it doesn't have a lot of that i feel like it is just a lot of people it's kind of like a csdm it's people just peeking each other over and over again and then spamming usp shots to each other's heads and my biggest problem i'll just put this at the end just to be a complete elitist is i just hate the fact that it's an absolute provable fact you can go and look at the mechanics of csgo the pistols aren't that accurate compared to 1.6 so the difference is at least in 1.6 if forrest shoots everyone in the head with the usp He's actually aiming yeah, those actually. bullets. Like, he's not, like, half spamming them and, and, like, juking people all the time. Unfortunately, CSGO, it's just the way that they actual, like... As far as I know, it's something to do with, actually, where they make, like, the movement within the game work. That if they fixed it for the... if they, Basically, if they made it how I want it for the pistols, they said for, like, the other weapons, it fucked something up. So, so as far as I can tell, they've never fixed this aspect. But, yeah, I kind of feel like pistols are a bit whack to me. I don't, I don't really see what the point is. For me as well, it's also that if you just go on a pistol... The headshot deathmatch server or whatever you try to take some random shots with usp while running it's actually pretty crazy how many times the at least the third like the the first bullet is really accurate and it's the same with the glock i mean that has even more uh or even less movement inaccuracy i think for me it would be nice uh perhaps if the pistols were sort of yeah, I, you need to be more stationary in in some way. Um, oh, I'll absolutely say, it. by the way, even just from my yeah. own personal experience, like, because whenever I use a Glock, it's a fucking terrible gun that can't aim any bullets. Anytime I ever, at any point in the game, get shot from a Glock from further than 10 meters distance, there's a 20% chance of my brain they're cheating. They must be cheating. That's unfair. <laughs> the cheating, it's cheating. <laughs> Even though I know it's not true in my brain, you know, how's he doing that? That's I definitely felt like a shot of a cheater. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just thinking about it in your brain. I, I don't know. It seems like you might be cheating me, boys. <laughs> oh, shit. But sorry, it's, it's only the piss around, though. <laughs> I'm just saying, keep your eyes out. Maybe do a preemptive pre report. <laughs> <laughs> just to be sure exactly <laughs> I do those reports where even though I think they're just aim hacking I do all three it's always the aim yeah, hacking yeah, yeah, yeah. I even just tick the yeah, other one I'm like, yeah you Everything. think fuck it why not just put other in as well maybe they do some other shit I don't even know about <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> By the way, one thing I appreciate about CSGO, though, to be fair, is that you know that they must have put the threshold on how many people have to report, et cetera, like pretty high up. Because you just know 99% of these are the equivalent of like back in the day on Windows, where it's like, would you like to send the error report fight back? It's like, you know, that just goes into a bin somewhere. Like, there's no way, there's no way they're checking all these reports. I'm yeah. reporting like 99% of people myself. Like I said, <laughs> themes kill me in a good way. It's like, I don't know, kid, did you earn that? At this point, at this point, they probably just have you flagged that all reports. Oh, I've gone down again. Yeah. Don't fucking I'm like that. I'm like that woman who keeps calling up the same TV show. Like, oh, this other guest I want to complain about. And there's like a there's like a, a post-it note in front of that like intern's desk. Like, ignore this woman when she calls in. Like, <laughs> that's probably me. I'm flagged. You're right. <laughs> I probably am at this point. To be fair. Right. What about this then? So another thing I thought I could ask you about was. Everyone else in the scene who was working events and stuff, like people don't realize we don't have time to watch FPL. We don't have time to watch the tier two, tier three scenes. Half the time people are working events at the same time. So everyone had heard the hype of Zewu and everyone had seen a few clips, you know, and heard all this like outrageous hype. Uh, you were around in the scene, basically, when he came up in FPL, when he came up with against all authority, etc. Like, was he actually someone you noticed early on? I mean, you always knew about him, right? Because just in general, especially at the lower level, if someone has incredible stats, it's typically because they, you know, deserve better in a sense. Um, it's not many, like, of the really lower tier teams that have so set roles that you have, like, a proper support or something like that, you know? Um, it's mostly just five guys, you know, all trying to... It's like everyone so, auditioning to get on the next bigger team, right? Yeah, it is kind of. It is actually pretty much that. So it's it's basically like one big FPL game, I guess, with just, yeah, worst players. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, we did uh, notice him. I, I played him a few times when uh, he played for against All Authority. One specific uh, match I, I have in mind right now is um, actually at the time, the biggest tournament that I qualified for was um, like a, a, a cup um, where in the grand final we were... Um, facing off against uh, AA, as they were called, against all authority, and um, like this was when I played in a team called LPSP, and that was right before I joined Sprout. I was like my individual skill level at that time was incredible. Uh, it might Here we have go. been actually. Here we go. No, I, get ready. Get ready for the story. He out opted him. He fucked up. Him, I can tell. I know where this is going. Come on. No, no, no. That's that's actually not even. No, the point okay. is actually the 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 complete opposite. Like the point is my individual skill level was. The highest that it maybe has ever been in my career. Okay. Like I was, I joined the team and I was, and it's not even a joke. Like it's the every other time way, I played Astralis, I was, okay. yeah, no, it's exactly like that. I, I got like 35 kills versus Astralis, North, like all these teams in prec. We played officials. I was still like just completely firing on all cylinders. We play um, AAA, Saibu, and um, it's basically one of our first officials. And I think on the first map, it ended like 16-13 on Nuke or something like that. I had life game, like two rating or something like that. And I still think Saibu had a better rating than me, even though like he <coughs> lost. No one else on his team was even comparable. Okay. Um, then we went on to Mirage. And uh, no, pr probably we had like 1.5 each or something. But still in such a close game, it's like super crazy, right? Then on the next game... The next map, uh, I should say, was Mirage, and we won like 16-5. And there it was, I had like life game, like 2.1 rating, like my highest rating of all time and blah, blah, blah. And Saivu had the same rating in a like 16-5 or 16-6 game. He lost 2-0, and I think he even had like better rating than I did. And I was having, like this is a match that I've even looked back on. Also, like in Sprout, times when I've struggled, like, and I've been in slums, I would always download that demo and look at that exact match to see, okay, can I mimic how I used to play when I was like super successful, okay. like winning every single duel and stuff like that. Um, and th this was just another day for Saibu. I was, you know, in the maybe individual form of my life. I was just, you know, in a team where it was almost like I was playing with four support players. Everyone just wanted me to clutch, to set me up and shit okay. like that. And then you had the fucking Saibu and he... The Make-A-Wish Foundation set up, as I call it. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy is, what he's got like four years on me, or five even, yeah. something like that. Yeah. And he was still, yeah, better than me. Uh, I mean, I've had matches like that in the past as well. I remember losing to Frozen, like when he was in Ecstatus, four years ago or three years ago or something like that. Just thinking, did when I When he was really a literal just fetus, to... just playing. <laughs> exactly. Did I, I, I remember even talking, talking to God Hunted, right? I said to him, like, 
bro, should I just quit? Like, I'm losing to 14-year-olds. I, I cannot be good at this game. Like, sure. I, I am trying it doesn't my sound hardest. good when you say it like that. I know. Like, yeah. Yeah. But it's like, I, I'm, I'm, exactly. I'm trying my hardest. I've been full-time for at least a year, right? I'm losing matches, not just to, like, teams that aren't, uh, they weren't even top 30 in the world. Sure. But it's also to mostly, mainly, a guy who's 14 years old and who does it for fun. Luckily, it turned I, out these were pretty good players, though. Yeah, I guess. But it's, at the time, it's sure. really hard to even admit to yourself that there might be people that are better than you. And also, they have five more years to become even better than they are now. Like sure. That's some of the, one of the hardest realizations to get to as a Counter-Strike player. Well, uh, don't, listen, don't let that part worry you too much. For all you know, maybe they fuck the whole life up, getting the drugs. Like, next thing you know, they're just homeless. They have a, a Classic like, you know, eSports story. Exactly, yeah. It, it could go badly for them, don't worry. Like, yeah. Honestly, that's what I've been banking on here. my entire exactly. career. Listen, that's why I've gone so heroic. Like, Sadly, you know, I thought, I thought that story was going to be even better, though. Nits instead, right? So, I, I was really uh, hoping uh, that story was going to be like, you know, at the time, like you didn't know him that well, and you had like the best game of your life. You dunked on him you were like fucking teabagging no, no, him no, after one we won and then after the game you just message him you're like listen kid you got a little bit of talent <laughs> i guess but you know come see me in a few years and then you know and then the story the only way the story would be better is you know years later you meet him at an event he just blanks you completely you're just like I, I, remember i played you in that cup a long time ago like, yeah. I'm, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry son i do not recall and then he just moves on like <laughs> <laughs> calls me son as well you know he's four years <laughs> yeah uh, was... by the way if, if frozen i mean frozen's too old now but if you ever are that kid by the way, anyone watching this episode if you're ever the kid who is owning everyone this is how you actually get even more fame <laughs> don't downplay the fact you're young play it up as you can see it only tilts them more yeah. like if right after that game frozen just had old tweets like just got my new pokemon cards <laughs> <laughs> just got, just got a bulbasaur guys just got a bulbasaur like that that would only tilt the people he's playing even more that'd be a brilliant approach yeah oh god that would really that would be really genius wouldn't it that'll be next level <laughs> if he just if he just beats you on a stage match walks out back and just starts hunting pokemon on his phone that would piss you to <laughs> Of course. Uh, just like, instead of giving you like a handshake on the stage, he's like, oh shit, can you tie my shoelace? I haven't learned how to do it yet. Uh, <laughs> that would be amazing. Fuck, exactly. Man. What a guy. What about, um, one thing along those lines that I, I wanted to ask is, like, do, do you actually think even back then, was Zero just some prodigy? Do you think it's just some guy who, like, it looks like he just came out the womb fucking shooting everyone in the head in Counter-Strike? Like, play, like you know, there's, uh, what's funny is people don't know this. There is actually quite an interesting divide between the people who are the prodigies and are just, like, like I'm not exaggerating, man. I think the first game I ever saw of Simple, he was already carrying. It was ridiculous. Like, like even when he was 16 years old. There yeah. are the people like that. But then there's the people where, fans wouldn't know this, but there are some truly great players who actually you weren't that amazing when they started and they really did just like hard work experience you know they had obviously had a great mindset and a work ethic and they grinded their way all the way up and they in the end they look at the finished product was like a prodigy you know you think oh this guy's fucking incredible but some of them weren't so some people aren't like that at the beginning and you never know that some of them were going to develop into the great players actually when you watch them so you think Zero was like was already a prodigy at the time i mean i think it helps um i, I think i saw some photo from a LAN. When he was like super young, um, you have the same with Stown in my team, right? He he was already, you know, tearing up uh, Danish lands when he was 13, 14 years old or something like that. And I think with those guys, what they at least have for them is that obviously they've been playing for a very long time from a very, you know, um, young age. But they've also, a lot of them started, you know, attending lands at a very young age. Sure. Yeah, that and helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and for me, it's like, firstly, you, you get like a lot of social experience, which is in some ways kind of hard to get when you're that age. And if you then also have the, you know, talent and I wouldn't say hard work because maybe when you're 13, 14, it's, it doesn't even feel like work at all. Like that's when you're, you know, having fun. Um, you know, I mean, not that I don't love my job, but sometimes it is work, you know. Um, I, I think it's the same for you guys, right? So, sure. how how uh, was the? Could you feel the change once you started getting paid for it? Could you feel like a different approach to practicing and trying to improve? Um, maybe not so much as professional, like simply because 
you know, I, I did YouTube first and I think that okay. was, you know, I did that as a side project thing. And then I started actually earning money from it and yeah. like making a name for myself. And then that was, you know, YouTube and Twitch and all that. Like I even did it when I didn't want to do it. And that made me not want to do it anymore because it, I associated with negative experiences, you know, for me as a player, it's like, I always worked hard in my opinion. Like, uh, I, I decided to, you know, quit doing YouTube, quit doing streaming. And then I, I wanted to go full time for two years. And if I didn't go pro before those two years, and I said it publicly, even like in a, in a documentary series in Denmark that I had two years to go pro. And if it didn't happen, I would just drop CS completely. And then I would go study. And I think it was like after a year and a half of playing full time with, you know, eight hour days and mostly right. teammates that weren't full time. So I had to play in the evening. Um, I had a girlfriend at the time and, and it was really you know rough having to play hours where she would get home from school and then I would start playing then as soon as I was done playing she would go to bed and then I wouldn't be ready to you know go to bed mostly because I, I still wanted to put in the work but also just I guess typically people who play computer games they don't really get up that early so sure. it, it, it wasn't that big of a change uh, like in terms of getting a paycheck when I got to Sprout I think I already had the mindset and carried that with me um, to return to your question, Duncan, like with with Saibu, um, I think it's always hard to know if these people are just prodigies. But having talked to some of the, I, I remember talking to NBK right when they were during the Water Boys phase, right before just they before went they to Vitality. Vitality Vessi, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I I told NBK like, holy fuck, like this guy. I mean, he is something special. I, I, I honestly did not believe in him. Uh, I, obviously, he was great, but typically it's that when you go from a from a not so great team and you have phenomenal stats or whatever, it's always like another test to see if you can bring yeah, that course. to another team. Not just a higher level, but also just it's another not even team. A, people don't realize it's actually not a diss on Ziwu if people are skeptical because most people don't make it through and become that level. But like the obvious example yeah. I could give you would be like Zantares. When he was on Space Soldiers, he looked fucking amazing. After that, we saw that he's, that's just the level at which he looks amazing. If you bring him to the top level, he's just an all right player, you know. No diss on him, he's just an all right player, you know. Not many people are going to make it through and be the simple of Tier 3 and then be the simple of Tier 1 as well. Like, it's pretty unlikely. No, no but in, in Zantara's defense, at least in that situation, right, like, we're, we're seeing now there was a level of dysfunction within Big, you know, sure. with everything going on leading up to the Gabi retirement. So... I mean, I, that's that's got to be tough too. Like, what a second a secondary and like language and like I'll be translating while you're. He's probably learning professional Counter Strike for the first time as well. I don't know. There, there's a lot of weird ones. I, maybe you could attest to this. You've been on a couple of teams now. What's the difference when you come into heroic and you have someone like Freiburg with leadership, or you have some of the pieces around you versus? trying to make it in a team where you don't have any kind of established roles or established players already on that team? Is it, is it harder to come up in that kind of a scenario? I, I think for me, it hasn't been that different because for me, it's always been, I've always been that type of player who took the role that just fit the team. Um, when I was a, a, a younger, more inexperienced player, then I was playing IGL, I was playing Rifle, and, and I was the one forming my own teams because at the time no one really wanted to play with me because I was you know, just a dumb YouTuber and stuff. Um, now, at, at this current level, like, I mean, because all the roles are down and everything, it's, it gives me some freedom um, in a sense that at least I don't have to sit and constantly think about, you know, what could my roles be and all that, but it also limits me in the way that I can't just go ahead and pick the roles that I would like to play and form the teams with the players that I would just like to play with. So, I don't know, I, I think um, the truly great players are the ones that can, you know, go from those teams where Ace Down, A Frozen, A uh, Saibu, I wouldn't even say like really erupts because he didn't have like any past teams. He's only yes. been performing on mouse yeah. balls basically. And, and he's a phenomenal player. Don't get me wrong, but it's always interesting to see these young talents that have like crazy stats, crazy aiming, crazy highlights, whatever. And then see them go from that one team where they were completely, you know, every, we could take, uh, you know, the Finnish guy, Yampi, the, the Finnish opera. He's also like a really upcoming guy, but he's, basically only playing, been playing in one team. And it's, I know from my time in LPSP that it's quite easy to go 
and be like the star player consistently in a team where you're set up to be the star player and you're there, you know, chilling with mates. There's not that much pressure on you and stuff like that. And then, for example, for me going to Sprout, like, even though this was, as I said, maybe my individual skill level peak um, so far, at least I was, you know, never losing a 50-50 fight, I felt. I still went on to Sprout and felt like I was super bad just because... Um, you know, it's it's a different uh, environment. All of a sudden, you're not getting the the stats that you're used to, and as a young player, that's hard. So, for me, it's just crazy that Saibu can get into a team with legit legends, and still somehow be in a position mentally where he's like, "I'm going to be the fucking star player of this team." Like, that, that's that's. I feel like that's you. another thing. Like, you can't. That's another aspect. You can't train someone into that mentality. Like, no. that's all. That in itself is almost like a talent that you just are born with, or it developed sometime in your life. I'm sure it was years before Counter Strike. Because there's another thing that we've seen many, many times. Is I, actually Rops is probably not a bad example. Rops is someone where actually his personality. I would actually com- contrast him like maybe with like a, as like a European elite. He's a guy who like by default's fairly quiet in like social settings. He's obviously, way younger than everyone else. He's like seems like a pretty hardworking guy. He's a guy who's like very self reflective, etc. Well, the problem is those are all great qualities in a human, but actually in a player, those can cause you to like self guess, second guess yourself. Maybe you wouldn't put yourself forward as the player that everyone should build the team around and give you all the resources. Like to actually, it's weird because a lot of times in young players, the guy who's like very forthright, it's going to come off in a negative way. Like they're going to be a bit of an arsehole or selfish. But I always tell people like, that's why you have to like really get to know them before you make that call. Because what you find with people like Simple is if you strip away the like negative expressions of that there might be something very positive behind it like because basically in the case of someone like simple one of the great things that people have now seen since you've got to see like the positive side of him as a person is he's not the guy who's just selfish and says just give me all the resources and i'll carry he actually understands that there's a responsibility in that that's why if they lose a game you'll often see simple basically say like i didn't play well enough myself even though to you or i it's like well he played amazing but it's like if he knows within his team the way he was self he needed to carry even harder in that match that's his philosophy it's like well that was my job i I was the one who was supposed to do that i should have done more so I kind of think that that's another aspect of when you're looking for like young talent is find people who've got that mentality because they're very thin on the ground. I don't think there's a lot of people who are like that. It's way more likely you're the guy with the talent, but you, your mind doesn't caught up. You know, you, you're immature as a kid or you just don't have confidence in yourself. Because if you're a kid and you don't know who you are, it, it's actually unusual. You would have all this confidence in yourself. I wasn't the person I am now 20 years ago when I played in Counter-Strike. It was a very different person, you know. It's also, I mean, having that having that mindset is is a skill, and it's also keeping that is also a, a sure. different skill set as well. That's why, like the guys like Forrest and like the old VP guys, and they were still playing. Like I, as someone who played competitive Counter Strike in two thousand and three, the mental game was the biggest thing that I lacked when I wanted to play CS:GO in two thousand and thirteen and fourteen. Was just like that that drive to grind practice and grind deathmatch and watch demos. Like I didn't mentally have that edge anymore. So if you're able to keep that long term as well. That's a pretty crazy thing when you think a career for some of these guys is starting at, you know, 17, 18 years old nowadays. I'll give you a little anecdote that's a ridiculous anecdote. Like, bear in mind, you've both played at a pro level. This is ridiculous that this could even be true, but it is true. So there's a guy who, in 1.6 in the early days, was one of the best Finnish players. He actually played with Nartu. He's a guy called Musa. And um, the thing about this guy was he just had one of the most fucking baller mindsets to be a LAN player I have ever seen in my entire life in esports. Because this is what he used to do, right? So in Counter-Strike... Like obviously nowadays you just use a config file etc but back then some people because they initially banned configs to stop you from cheating some people used to manually set up their config through the UI of Counter Strike right so you go into the settings keyboard you set all these stuff up you know right what this guy used to do Nato is he would go into the Counter Strike settings in 1.6 and there was a button that said reset to default he would press that button and then play the game and I remember saying to him like well, no, it just makes sense, though. Like, I get, like, you know, and he goes, no, no, but it just saves time, doesn't it? You know, I just use whatever the default keys are bound. And I said, no, no, but what does it make sense about that, Musi? is like, th- that, like, you-, you do understand that, like, the sensitivity value will be different. Like, the sensitivity in Counter-Strike, for anyone who doesn't know, was always three. That was the default sensitivity, right? And I said, but the problem is, think about it. Like, on a different lap, on a different PC, on a different mouse, that's going to be a different three, isn't it? Like, the three's not going to be out. And he even said, he just goes, 
Yeah, I never thought of that, actually. And this guy had played for years and was a very good pro. The whole point is Nato. By the way, he was absolutely wrong about that. Like, obviously, he should have set his sensitivity and he should have learned it. Sarah. But the reason I'm saying that's a baller mindset is his mindset was like, I'm going to play the way I'm going to play anyway. And I'm not going to let any small detail get in my way. And if I'm playing, for example, and the mouse feels weird, I'm not going to think to myself, well, I didn't set it exactly right and I didn't measure it. I'm just going to adjust. I'm just going to like play a little bit for 10 more minutes. I know I'm going to get used to it. And even though it is objectively a bad approach to take, the idea he could have the mindset that none of that would phase him is amazing. Like you won't, you won't, you can't train someone to have that mindset. Like that guy, he was just one of those guys who you see in like a war movie where, you know, there's another guy over here is crying, having a breakdown because he just saw his brother die and then this other character over here is like the hero and then there's always that one character who's just like fucking like nothing can touch him he's just seen everything you know he's just like back out we go boys he's just got like a machine gun just <laughs> mini gun in a whole village down and it's just like well that's your job you are just a fucking legend whoever you are no, I don't, you know I wouldn't want to have to fucking work next to you on a factory or salt line but as long as we're killing all these enemies just get this guy out here I want him on my team oh, and it's, that's ridiculous isn't it like, anyone would do that not even have the same fucking sense of from match to match especially what a god <laughs> Especially back in those days with those those PCs, that's wild. Of course, that's outrageous, isn't it? You used to go to such weird lengths to like make sure their mouse sensitivity was the same. Like have like marker yeah. lines on their mouse pads so they know how far their mouse moves to do a one eighty and shit. It was it was wild. It's a wild west, man. Well, I actually have a like now that you mentioned earlier with with Mertz, um, I have an anecdote with him. There was like one of the first lands that he was playing. Um, he he apparently. I've never done it, but he had some program installed where he could test like the the hertz of his mouse, yeah. and he found out that it was I don't know maybe he, like the admins let him install it or whatever because he said he had issues with his mouse or whatever. He at least found out that he had issues with his uh, mouse, and then I think honestly he just borrowed a random mouse from someone in the audience, and he still played like incredibly well and i always heard it from um cyclone who i used to play with and he used to play with merch that okay. you know merch he also <laughs> he, he would do exactly the same he, he could play you know a different sensitivity he could play a different mouse pad a different mouse whatever and he'd just be like you know it doesn't doesn't phase me uh, it i i think it's also really really sick mindset but also especially on land because for me there'll always lot, be something on land that's slightly off right that's what fans don't realize yes yeah it can and, never and also feel 100% like your home setup. Of course not. So you want to widen your comfort zone, right? Yes. And basically, if you if you don't care about your settings, then your comfort zone is insanely wide. Sure. You know, I guess you've got the biggest comfort zone ever. Then the only thing that you're really looking for from the experience um, is like you know dealing with 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 the pressure of playing the match itself like sure. you don't have to even ever worry about am I not good enough all these things because you're just you, you know, you're just going to play like you always do. It's the same. Um, like, I had it in LPSP especially that even if I had a bad start to a game, I always had the mindset that, like, if I am actually better than all of the other players on the server, then it will show at the end. I might have zero kills after 10 rounds, but if I'm really the best, like, then in 20, like, after 20 rounds, I'll be up there with them, you know. And, and I that's also a m mindset that gave me a lot because then... The context of the game never mattered. It was just, you know, on a round-to-round -round basis, and I knew towards the end of the game, I would always be on the top of the scoreboard. Sure. What's funny is this actually makes me realize, Moses, like, it's a good job I was never actually good at Counter-Strike because not only would my trash-talking game be off the fucking chain, <laughs> but even worse than that, I, I have, I've just watched too many movies. Like, I know, like, how storylines work in movies that are satisfying in real life. So I'll give you a quick story, right? There's, I once read this amazing story about... Because I, I was very interested in poker and in, in finding out about the history of poker, obviously, in the early days, it literally was people in, like, the equivalent of the Wild West, etc., doing all scams yeah. and you know, all the crazy story. Well, in the modern day, right, there's a player who, he's quite a famous player, called Amarillo Slim, right? And he was someone where, at the time that poker started to become vaguely a sport, he'd spent his whole life not only playing cards, but he was like a hustler. You know, he had all sorts of scams and things. And the the whole point of these scams that make them amazing is it's like something out of a Hollywood movie. Like this, like the levels they'll go to in these scams to make it so you can never figure out what they're doing oh, and yeah. how it works. Like, so I'll give you one that he would do was he would go and he would play pool against people while drinking for hours and hours and hours. And what he would do was he'd play these people and he'd like, he'd win a game he'd let them win two games he'd win a game but it'd be close and then out of nowhere late in the night right he'd do something like he'd win like uh 
a game like just narrowly against some guy who, you know, he'd been setting up as like the mark, you know, the guy where he's been drinking with him and the guy's been beating him just enough and the guy's talking a bit of shit. And then what he'd do is out of nowhere, he'd just say to the guy, tell you what, you think you're better than me because, you you know, you just won by like one ball. I bet I could fucking beat you with and then just look randomly and go, that fucking broom over there. But I could play with my other hand and that broom and beat you in this next match. And obviously the guy would go, what the fuck are you talking about, boy? I'll take that bet all day long. And what would happen is, you know, he'd get them to do like, if before they were betting $100 a rack, now it would be like $10,000. Exactly. Right. So they do a massive bet. And I, I, I'm sure you know where the story's going. He'd absolutely wreck this guy using a broom on his left hand. Now, if you, if you know the way the story goes, you might have guessed here. He'd just spent 10 years practicing to play with that exact broom that he'd set up in the room on his left hand. He was a genius. Like, like that's the one aspect of you with the other guy. You could never think of your thinking. Genius. <laughs> I mean, to no, me, it's genius. Like we're pushing it here. To me, you have to make you'd to have me, to it's genius. a lot of motherfuckers. Listen, it's <laughs> worth it, Moses. That's a legendary <laughs> story. But here's the point. This is why I would have been an absolute cunt if I was any good. Because see the story he just told there. I would set up those stories. I'd come in with a mouse that isn't even man and it'd be all wonky I'd be like nah fucking the mouse is all off is anyone here has got a mouse some random kid just goes I guess I could lend you this one mister well, I don't even play with that one though secretly it is my actual mouse <laughs> I'd take it out I'd own the whole game and then I'd even like the kid would be a plant by the way I'd give it back to the kid at the end thanks kid not a bad mouth if I say so myself I'd just walk off and everyone would be like the stories that would develop in the community like this sadly someone would probably figure out eventually I was doing this and then I'd actually ruin a whole career so well yeah it'd be like the part. same kid at every event they're like we yeah, recognize exactly that. yeah <laughs> <laughs> So what's um with, with heroic? I mean, this this rise up. You think by the end of the year you'll be top ten? You said. Oh, I never said at the end of the year, but I. Okay. I, you I think, did you think say that eventually. Yeah, I, I think maybe the end of the year is pushing it because right now we've like we're playing really good, and it's also kind of the same point that I wanted to make with with at least Saivu that it's also really hard to judge a, a team or a player or whatever abilities when you haven't really seen them go through hardships. Like, we haven't seen Saivo have a, a really, like, big slump. And the sure. same for my team. We haven't seen, like, <coughs> part of, you know, being a professional is also being able to recover when it's not going well. Um, so, especially also now with the fact that we're not at the major, we will likely be moving out of the top 20, I would imagine. Um, and with that, we are going to have to fight for every single tournament again. We're not going to get any invites. Um, so, it's it's going to be hard. Um, I think we do have the level, but we also need the time because you need the time to attend these events and actually climb your way up the ranking to even get the invites so that you can stay there, right? Sure. And because of the major, we're going to be pushed all the way down. So is I it, think at the end of the year is a bit rough, but I think we'll get there eventually, yeah. Is it, is it harder to compete with top 10 teams or climb the climb the ladder far enough to get invites for events like what, what's the tougher gauntlet to run is constantly being playing against top 10 teams at these events like IEM Chicago or is it you know the qualifying process of trying to go to so many events through the throughout the online qualifiers and trying to climb the ranks high enough to get the invites like what is the what is the taller mountain I mean we've had pretty good luck in the qualifiers um, I think there's not many teams that are lower than us on the rankings that we've lost to at least recently force is the only one that comes to mind for me um i think obviously attending the events and trying to be the top 10 teams is the hardest but at the same time i i don't know if it's because i just still have not adjusted to the fact that we are actually as good as we are or if it's because all these like top teams legendary brands like we threw Fnatic out of the out of the epl finals yes. for example sure. which was a pretty incredible result it's i'm it's hard for me to tell if it's them. It's exactly in the you know example with Fnatic. It might be them doing very poorly, but take Vitality at uh, I Am Chicago, the first game we played there. You can't just put that all on them playing bad, right? Like, sure. At some point, it's also us that are playing really good. Um, so I, I don't know if... if I, I feel like the top 10 team should be better. I feel like we still have so okay. much to improve on. Um, so the qualification processes, I would say, are hard. Obviously, it's harder to play at these big events, but yeah, I don't know. It, it might even like sort of be a tie for me because I feel like when we actually play these top teams and we, we obviously try hard because we go to these events, 
we we are winning obviously not more often than not because we are being thrown out of all the tournaments but we're winning against many of these teams that i think we wouldn't be able to beat and in the online online qualifiers you can always lose to you know a, a force or not saying that they're bad at all but like you could lose to to a, a so to say worse team um it is in the end just a bit you know luck of the draw um, By the way, one thing I want to ask about is, right, the Danish scene, especially thanks to the work of people like MSL, Snappy, Hunden, these people who are below the top team and have brought through all this talent when their own talent got taken or went to other squads, etc. I think actually the Danish scene has to be one of the ones, along with the NA scene, that's the most known, like the level of talent within it, all the players below. And usually you can kind of see as a result who's coming up. Like, for example, anyone who saw the Fragsters team over the last year or so knew that, like, Stown, the player in your team, was going to eventually be on a good team. Like, he's an obvious player. Refresh is another example. Mertz coming up through the North Academy team. Like, all these players coming through make sense. So how the fuck did Blame F literally... <laughs> apparently he was off in the fucking Bizarro realm or something. And out of nowhere... Because I looked it up. Apparently on HLTV.org it says he's 22 years old. Mm. Right? This guy, even like a year ago, basically, was a complete nobody. It wasn't even that he was in these other Danish teams. He was in Epsilon, a team that no one even remember. Last time Epsilon was even relevant was in Smoothies on them. So then not even a particularly relevant team nowadays. And goes from there to Heroic, to be the best player in the Heroic, to be the IGL and the Fragger, to basically be like, kind of like what Nico was doing in FaZe the last year. Like, how does this guy come out of nowhere? Like, I never even heard of him on anyone's radar. No one was telling me, look out for this player, or he's the next hot If For those in, outside of Denmark, it feels like he absolutely came out of like, he's dropped out of the sky somewhere. Yeah, it felt like that in Denmark as well. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it is, like, I mean, I did play against the guy in a random tournament like two years ago. Um, but he wasn't anything special. And I think something that I've at least started to realize, and this is a, a general thing, I guess, is that um, when you have these guys, just, I mean, take take a look at him. You know, he's fucking massive. Because he goes to the gym all the time. He's like he's an gym. absolute unit of a man. Yeah, he's, he's exactly he's... an absolute unit, yeah. But, <laughs> but when you have these people who are like absolute units or... I, I, I'm also, like, I've also... I've had this talk before where, like, you have Elige... And I heard that he was like, I'm not really that great at, I think he was like valedictorian or something like that. Oh, he's a very yeah. smart guy, yes. Yep. Super yeah. smart guy, right? And 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 it comes with something like valedictorian. I'm not sure if that was exactly what he was, but when it comes from something like that, it's more than just brains. It's also hard work. I, I at least believe that you can't, you know, it's kind of the same in Counter-Strike. Also, I have to believe that, you know, you cannot be a simple or a cyber if you're not also working hard. So when sure. you have these people... Um, that have like good grades or are absolute units, typically it's because they're used to putting in the hard work in their like h- hobby or uh, work, like school, whatever it may be. And so naturally that transfers when the focus shifts. So for Blame F, the focus went from him, you know, caring about his fitness, which he obviously still does. But now he's like putting in those hours that he normally would spend you know, working out of the gym like crazy. He spends them on Counter Strike, and he's. I mean, he he doesn't when we are at events, for example, because he also has his fitness. He doesn't drink alcohol, so most of the days when if we're out of a tournament, I think it only really happened at Cologne that we had like extra time. You know, we're all out partying, or maybe you know people were spending time with the girlfriends and stuff. And and Benjamin is just sitting there at his PC doing 10-hour days, just watching demos, finding out new strats, you know, like playing FPO, all these things. And that's why, to me, it's like I would always pick a teammate who would be like a valedictorian or, um, you know, is like really swole or whatever because, you know, it's just a a personality trait. Um, Normally, you would, like the the stereotype is that if you have like a, a guy who's like super, super strong or whatever, he's probably stupid, you know? Um, Benjamin is, is not stupid by any means. And the only thing that you can actually see from the way that he looks is that he's willing to work hard. And I mean, it would have been harsh from- if that story instead was like, and you know what? You're damn right. All he does, <laughs> but you know what? He's great for carrying boxes. So yeah. you should tell him, you know, <laughs> that would be a bit unreasonable if that was the end of the story. Yeah, keep going yeah. anyway. Yeah, no, but but I mean, the point is almost uh, almost here. But for me, at least, it's like you. the only thing that you can really realize from a guy like that, if he's not, you know, 
<laughs> just uh, binging on steroids or something like that. It is that he is putting in the work. And typically, people who are willing to put in the work in their fitness, in their school, in their normal work, or whatever they're doing, like those are the ones that will transfer it to CSGO, and that becomes their main focus. And that's sure. why you can have a player like him, who, who apparently had a hidden talent, but also, sure. you know, who is putting in more you know, hours of work. The thing is there, Moses, it, it sounded like at the end, he almost made the case against it, though. He was like, oh, and he was really swore on that. Like, but then it was just steroids. steroids and steroids? Cheating. So no, wait a minute, no, no. what about in Cal Strike? <laughs> yeah, he never used to be in one two years ago, but then I used to, what's weird is I used to say, How, how'd you get good? He goes, a lot of time in the library, he had all these books to them, programming and PHP, like, you know what the fuck? Yeah, that's <laughs> that different. That, that, that no, this is what I can't handle, Moses. They already have all this mad talent in their scene. I was like, going to say, these, why is all, all these legends? in Denmark oh it's worse than that Moses it's one thing if it's just players and they're actually pros apparently if you're walking around in Denmark in Copenhagen you know a doorman opens up like, excuse me sir you like to come in that's probably just Valde like two years out from being a pro then you go in like the guy comes in he's just the you know the short order chef who's cooking your burger that's Blame F he's about to become a pro in three years fucking hell what's going on around here are they all secretly just sick of CS and there's like some of them just aren't allowed to play us and what the fuck what the fuck's going on oh no uh, it's rough honestly though that's also kind of one of my biggest pet peeves it, it, it at least reminded me of that that whenever I do talk to someone from Denmark it's always like yeah I mean I used to play Counter Strike 10 years ago I wish I would have kept at it you know but I had other stuff I had school and stuff but I could probably you know be oh, they all think uh, they could do right now right. Yeah. Okay. it's like I mean, I understand, yeah, probably if you had played it for 10 years, but it takes more than just, you know, deciding that you want to do it. And it, it's always like everyone, there's also many fans, like there's not really that many things that can trigger me, but I always get a bit like, sometimes it's not even Counter-Strike. It's like, yeah, also, you know, I played football in a decent level and stuff. I could have, you know, also made it, but then, you know, I decided to do something else. Plus, they're not realizing it's not even about skills, boys. Like, you wouldn't be able to handle the mandatory first two years of choking that are part of the great cultural tradition of Denmark <laughs> in Counter Strike. Like, that would break a lot of people, you know, to go oh, yeah. through those years, you know, <laughs> being so close to victory and then essentially pushing the plate away from yourself and saying, I've had enough, thank you, while you're actually starving inside. Yeah, it's good. Saying, we have no, no, you like have liquid, the rest. You, know? you have more. You have the basically Danish Counter Strike is like in England. We have a cultural problem. That might sound weird. Where there's a famous thing, right? That in to be polite in England, if there's like a plate of biscuits and you're all having, you know, like coffee time, tea time. If there's one biscuit left, right? Even if you want the biscuit, you're supposed to offer it to the other person. And the idea is, he's supposed to also say to you, "No, no, you have it." And then that's when you're allowed it. That's like a cultural way of showing that you know I'm not being selfish. That's like Danish Counter. -Strike strike basically is like that you desperately want that championship at the end they're like no, no you have it verts pro and then they're <laughs> polish mess and they just go thank you mm, delicious kurva like they, they're just fucking loving it and you're like no no but i secretly wanted that it's like well, should have said you're we very weird nordic guy very weird it's like <laughs> That, I don't, that, was like some sort of, that was some sort of mixture between like a Turkish accent and Pasha or something. I don't know where I was going with that one. I was freestyling a little bit there, boys. What about <laughs> this, though? I've got a question, because the weird thing about Heroic is people only remember the old-school Heroic, the snappy one, which was fully Danish, obviously, except uh, technically they had Modi, but whatever. He didn't have any issues in that team. And then the team that they had between, though, was the one where it was just like a revolving door. It was like, here's a player who's been recycled from this team and he's either going to go down a level or he's going to go back up again and he's briefly in heroic well now it's basically back to a danish team plus freiburg now so have you actually also become is it a more tactical team now it seemed like in the in the previous one that I had last year whenever i talked to them it sounded like they ran like a pretty loose system because of the type of players they had and they had constantly getting new players is it more is it more of the classically tactical danish team now um i mean in the sense that we always have a plan from spawn, um, it's, I mean, we do play defaults, but it's not that often, like, um, just an example, you know, Opas, if, if we want to do like a B default, then there's a point. Maybe we are doing the triple nades, maybe we are, you know, trying to search an entry or something like that. Um, but we also do have a lot of calls where on nuke, you know, we have fast stuff where we're just going to go right off the bat and, uh, you know, rush somewhere, right? Um, I think it's not more strategic than any other team I've played in, 
But actually, what I I did hear, and I don't know if it's true because I just I mean it's like a, a rumor or whatever. But I but I did hear that about the old like heroic lineup. The problem was actually that they um, they had like differences in what they wanted, I guess, with the team. In the sense that there were some players when where whenever there were like a lot of casualties on the server, right? If it's like it turned into a two on two or three or three something like that. Some of the players would always be like, okay, guys, let's go back, take a breather, and then we'll make a new plan and we'll do that. And right. the other half of the players were more like, okay, let's capitalize on the frags that we have. Let's try to take some room. Let's try to... Okay. So I, I think with how it is right now, it's it's a pretty loose system in the sense that everyone can do whatever they want. Um, it's very rare that we have you know, a, a strat or something where it's so important that everyone performs that exact role. Um, but we do have a, a very deep strat book, which is obviously also needed. Um, I, I think actually Roy currently is one of the more looser teams I've played. Um, okay. But but I, I, that's not to take away from the fact that you know Blame F is doing a really good job in game leading because typically for me at least, if you have these teams where you play more loosely, then you can't really attribute um, the wins, the victories as much to the in-game leader as sure. you would have if, you know, it's the same. Um, it's really hard, or basically, I would say impossible to probably have the uh, individual impact that Blame If has, like frag-wise and stuff like that, if you are also a super strategic in-game Of course. Yeah. You have to, you know, you have to have players that can think for themselves, take some initiative, play play a bit of a loser style. Um, but But he is, you know... Now, especially that we don't have a coach, he is the guy who's making all of the new strats or stealing them from other teams, uh, putting in a, in a lot of hours there. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe that's also why we are actually performing so well is that we can even change style mid-game. We have games where we play super loose and we just we we have some you know strats as well that we've copied from teams that play a very loose style and then we do that feel it out then if that stuff is not working we go back to maybe some more you know uh, rigid system where um, everyone has a set role on an execute and we know exactly what's going to happen um, so yeah we like to change it up uh, i mean it's a, it's a long answer for basically saying i don't know but um, yeah <laughs> I, I hope i at least provided a bit of insight to my thinking sure. while i was, no, was uh, getting there What's it? What's it like? Uh, kind of being like a CS, like a Danish Counter Strike team at this point, where there's so many Danish players, so many Danish teams, such like a pedigree with Astralis being like the best team last year. Is it? Is it weird? Like, do you always feel like you're in a shadow? Do you feel like you don't get a lot of attention because Astralis is is right there above? No, actually not. I think we get a ton of attention. Um, <laughs> I mean, part of it is that we're also getting some upset wins, but I think when we actually do something that deserves credit. I think we get it. Like we get it from Reddit, HLTV, also the the Danish site does too. Um, like people are on our side. It feels like, and and I, I think we do get the the credit that we deserve. I think also one of the things that's so super important about our team, especially, is that we are also sort of a, a no chance thing, right? You have Freiburg. He was a bit of a reject in a sense. Blame if he Flip was that. a. Deep, yeah, no, but it's. I mean, I guess he he at least had a. He also had a you know the the stint at Optic and and stuff, but it felt like he he needed a a good place to stay. Um, I think Firebreak is a is a guy who likes to stay on one team for a long time instead of switching all the time, right? Blame if, as you said, uh, Duncan, like he he was out of the Danish scene completely. No one really even knew him. Uh, is attack. I think is so like he's a really really phenomenal player, but he's also kind of been kept out of the better teams. I, I it it would have been an obvious choice for for a North in my opinion, and the same with Stown. Like he's not a reject. Uh, probably everyone would like to play with Stown in Denmark, but he's not quite there yet. And sure. I mean, same for me. I had to to even get onto a proper team. I had to go elsewhere. I had to go to yeah. Germany, right? So I think because of that, we have like. Uh, uh, a pretty good bond within the players, uh, like w within the team. So even if a, a better team were to come and contact us, I think there's, and it's not something I would normally say, but I think there's Ooh. a legit possibility that 
people would stay. Oh, he's oh, done it. No. He's actually done it, Moses. He's done it. <laughs> oh, he's, done... God. he's actually drunk the Kool-Aid. He not only oh. drunk the Kool-Aid, at the end, he but, smacked hey, his lips with... If- if if people were to leave, <sighs> I, I would encourage it. Like if they get okay. a better offer, fucking take it. Like I will never well, be the guy. Here's the thing, though, Nato. This is the problem. Is like basically, if you've been in Mia Moses' position, you've heard the same chant a million times. Because what happens is, uh, yeah. right, everyone in your team knows. Like, like, well, the funny thing is, actually, in terms of level in the game, your team's actually at a comparable level to North and the Optic teams, etc. Like, if you look at performance, but the problem is. Because in terms of the scene, it's perceived that it's better. Yeah. I mean, there's obvious reasons why it's better to be in North. Like they have the whole FC Copenhagen thing and they have a, a winning history, at least in the past, you know. And so the, put it this way, all I'll tell you is... About they have a two, winning history in the past. North. Yeah, they won, they won some shit in the past. Yeah, okay. They won two Dream Act Masters, mate. You let me know yeah. when you win one. I'll no, fucking no, big you up as well. No, you know? just saying, yeah, I, I just don't saying. think anyone is thinking of North and then thinking... They've got a winning past. Yeah, because everyone's a daft little cunt. Like, everyone had told me Nipper is winning org. Yeah, about fucking half a decade ago, mate. Not, not <laughs> get that ass in the last few years anyway. Yeah, okay. Point is, point is, point of yeah, one second. Like, the, I, I know a player a couple of years ago who was a rising talent in Denmark, and he told me this. I didn't even ask him. He told me to my face, like, listen, you have to understand, Thorne, I'll never join North. I don't care if they give me the offer. I'll say no. I'll stay with my boys and I bring them up and we become better than North. And then if maybe they won my whole team, then maybe I join. Literally one year later, he joined North, by the way. So just going to ah. say, like, listen, that story, no, but- it's a, it's as old as time. Like, the point is, though, listen, that's, uh, in my opinion, I know if you're in the team, you don't want to talk about that. Why would you? It's, it's not a good topic. But if you're in a team like you're in, it's just the reality. You know, if, if you get an awesome offer, there's a chance someone takes it. I mean, what you know, it'd be I, hard to I blame said, them, I would, right? I would really encourage it. Like, if someone gets a better offer, it, they, they are not only my teammates, it's like my co-workers and everything, they're my friends as well. And, uh, I mean, it is, as you said, it's, it's pretty obvious that at least the facilities and just the, I guess, the prestige from playing in a team that's been perceived as the second best is something that's really hard to turn down. So I would never have any bad feelings about anyone doing that in my team. But it's going to make the heartbreak so much worse. It's going to make it so much worse. Yeah, but if you're smart, what you do is this. You let the guy go to the next team. So let's say Blame F gets recruited to North or something, right? You let him get recruited. And then all you do is you stay really great friends with him. And then, you know, every now and then you just throw the odd line in. Ah, it looks like Yogi's struggling a little bit. It's not like when I was back, <laughs> back in the day, you know. We had a really good oh, synergy, you know. Okay. We kind of understood each other, you know. Anyway, who am I to keep you? You go to your team. Best of luck anywhere. with the future. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think so many players do that, though. It's incredible. Uh, Here's how it's going to happen is, you know, it's going to be North is going to approach you and you'll be like, no, nah, I think we've really got something here. And, I think <laughs> and then they just take the other guy, his teammate. And then yes. Blaine after comes there in the next day, he's like, well, boys, uh, got the offer to North. I'm out of here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind at all. I think if anyone like has any possibilities to go to somewhere better, they should. And I also just want to make it like 100% clear that I, I have nothing against North. It's not like that. It's just I think the history, like, I don't – do do you really – I, I, I have you to really ask, Donkey, like, do you see them as a winning team? Like, for me, it's Put it like – Pretty I uh, Yeah, go on. Yeah, it's just for me, it's always been like, so say they haven't lived up to the true potential. It's obvious that they have the potential both in like who's behind North, but sure. also in terms of the players. And it seems like they've never really accomplished what they they should have. Like, No, but it's like I say, I give the contrast there because in terms of actual level, Heroic, Exoptic and North are all at the same level pretty much. Like, it's a similar band of like where you'd expect to place in the tournament, who you'd expect them to beat, who you'd expect them to lose to. But that doesn't mean they're all identical teams. Like, like everyone wouldn't want to play for all three identically because they're all equally as good. Like, let's face it, like, the history does sort of have an inertia that carries through yeah, to sure. this day. So even though I know what you mean, like, North was never what Astralis was, ever. They weren't even what really TSM was back in the day. They did have a period where they were very solid top 10. They were probably, like, bro- like breaking in the top five. Like I say, they did win some massive tournaments. They had, they've been legend spot at majors. Like, these things do all add up. Even, even though, by the way, the, the reason it's ridiculous now is, like, the reason none of that should actually count for North is they don't have MSL, and it was MSL who's teams were the ones that did all that so to me i don't count it as that personally but in a way that is associated with the name when you think of them them in your mind like for example if north and heroic are at the same level now here's the difference we look at heroic and go fucking hell you guys are doing great we look at north we go wow still not doing well good enough are you guys but as i say 
similar levels of team, right? So I think everyone treats teams differently. It's the same reason why it doesn't matter how bad Nip ever got. They were never actually like considered a bad team in the true sense. Like, like same thing. Everyone was like, well, I wonder if they're ever going to get it together. Like yeah. I often say this to people, you know, there's actually, it's now been the case for like three or four years. There's actually zero logical reason Nip could ever be number one again in the world. Zero logical reason. Because every reason you'd give is a reason that only applied years ago. Like, well, they had Get Right and Forest. Yeah, well, that doesn't mean that much anymore. Well, they get the top talent, but did they anymore? Fnatic tends to get them nowadays. You know, like, every, Swedish Counter Strike's the best. Well, it isn't the best anymore, though, is it? Like, they don't have IGLs. Like, there's actually, it's kind of depressing, but every reason goes against it. But listen, even when saying that, I still kind of think a nip and go, fuck, they should be better than they are, shouldn't they? Come on, it's Nip. Yeah. Like, that, you know, it takes a long time to, like, I think, ruin that rep in that sense. So I know what you mean. Like, it might sound like I oversold it. They're certainly not, like, some dynasty team that won great championships. But put it this way, if I was in the Danish scene, even I would still want to play for North after Astralis. That's the team I would want to go to next. Even though for a while, actually, funnily enough, the Optic team had more talent, I thought, when they had Config and Cajun. And that, I think that team actually looked like they had talent. Yeah, I agree. That's actually also why I, I think North is also the team, harsh as it might sound, that should be the most criticized in the Danish scene because they have this amazing backing. And they are, at one point in time, they had the scene on lock where, yeah, they couldn't have the Astralis players, they could have anyone else they wanted. So uh, to me, are. they should have the best results compared to everyone else. They're, they're probably the most criticized Danish. If you take the blast stuff away from Astralis, sure. I think I think North gets gets piled on pretty hard, which, I mean, fair fair play. We've been waiting for them for, for some time. So I don't think it's unjust or anything like that, but they do get, they get dumpstered that's, pretty hard. Like, it's that's, why I think they're right. in a tough spot though, because like on the one hand, if you look at the players they have, it's unreasonable, the expectations of them. Like that's actually what they're doing now. They're actually performing pretty well for who they have. It's just that, yeah, if you look at the context of they're in the Danish scene, they were number two position. Like they should have been able to get the blame Fs of the world should have been in their teams. If you think about it, right. They should have those guys. Like the idea that they're Whoa. still sat. Well, maybe we can ask Nato about this. He's in the Danish scene. This is one of the things that kills me about their squad is they're still sat around looking at their watches waiting for fucking Kirby to have his like fourth good game this year. Like, like they're still waiting for that. Whereas there's talent out there in the scene. It was very good players who aren't in or what do you think of North? Uh, I, I mean, especially with the Kirby thing, I, I have to say, I'm, I completely disagree. Like, uh, I think at least right now he's showing better form under Velde. I, I haven't checked the stats, so it's not like, I mean, uh, but at least from, from watching the, the documentaries, for example, I, I am every time just taken aback by what an incredible teammate Kirby is. Like he's every time they lose or whatever, he goes out and he says, "Fuck that, guys." There, there's two more maps, and every time you know everything is going well, he's the one hyping them up, and he's you know when the when the team is getting stressed, he's like, "Okay, guys, let's calm it down a bit." Like he's making sure everyone is focused. He's doing what everyone should be doing individually. Like in terms of the mental game, at least it seems like he's doing it for everyone. It, like North doesn't even need a mental coach because they have a guy like him. And I think that's because he has the, you know, not in, only is it crazy because he's a young guy, but he has that experience from Astralis. And I, I think he provides way more than what is shown on the server. But even on the server recently, I think he's actually showing quite good form. So I, I think. I might he's have agreed with you some months ago, but right now I, I don't think he's like, I think he's one of the most important players on North for sure. He, he's got the same problem that you have um, w with what we just discussed, like the optics of Kirby, like between like how you perceive his performance in his career, because he's, he's also been what the major MVP with Astralis. And then it was very obviously public that he, you know, switched teams like the day of a roster lock and, um, you know, went over to North to be the star player. And if you're going to make that switch, if you're going to go from like major winning to wanting to be the badass superstar on the next team, right, then you better perform like the expectations yep. rise and you get you get criticized more when you when you fail to reach those those levels. So I think that's the big thing for me with Kirby is it's just like, if I look at your decisions, like you wanting to be the star on this North team, you going from Astralis, which then went on to be the best team in the world for a year. And actually, now that I say that out loud, that was probably punishment enough. But the poor, like the poor guy, you just put those expectations on yourself. Sure. Uh, I think also, like, I at least am, am not the type of guy who would say, like, even if you go from Astralis to North to become the star player, the fact that he didn't become the star player I think that's 
I think that speaks like positively about Kerby. I don't know if you see it differently, but at least the way I see it, that means that he went to a team, found out, hey, they don't need, you know, a star player. They need someone who is maybe more a role player and who can actually calm down the people when they are, you know, getting a bit hyped. He can hype them when, you know, they they start winning and make sure that they have. Let him finish. Let him finish. I've got this one. Moses. Let him finish. Keep going. Yeah, no, but it's it, it, I. I am more or less finished. You can go ahead. Okay, <laughs> right. That that's a great story, right? And if you were if you had to babysit Kirby's kids and put them to bed and let them know their dad's not a loser, I'd tell them that story if I were you. Flip to page four. Look, and then what happened is lovely Kirby, your dad. Yeah, you know this guy. Look at look at the guy there with the. I know he looks like he's cheating because he keeps like shaking his wrist. <laughs> like that, that's apparently legit. So don't worry about that. Uh, and basically, he came to North, and it's not that he failed. No, no, that's that. Don't even use those words, kids. Failure. We don't use that in this house. <laughs> what he did was he just realised that the team, maybe the real fragger in the end was the friends we made along the way. Like, fuck it. Like, no, listen, Nato, I know what you were trying to do there, mate. Listen, I even agree with some of the social stuff. He actually is someone, by the way, I'll give credit to you. He has a very good mentality, actually, for a young player. And I've actually yeah, never heard of him having problems. But first of all, the accountant at North definitely doesn't think it's a really cool story that he came over, got the biggest fucking contract, and is now playing a not the star role. That accountant doesn't think that at all. Secondly, the idea that he came over and he was like... Uh, Dr. Kirby will see you now. Ah, uh, Dad knows. The thing North doesn't need is a really sick, hard carry fragger like I was supposed to be and promised I'd all be, you guys, because we've got Mertz. Can you? No, not, not Mertz. Um, <laughs> fucking Valde. Oh, he's IGL now. Uh, Yogi. Is he even alive still? Oh, he is, apparently. Yeah. Oh, like, uh, <laughs> Get him in, I guess. Like, come on, man. If the one thing they do need in that team is a fucking sick player, just like Kirby used to be. Like, that's some bullshit. Listen, I know what you mean. In the context that he but, can't be that, because apparently he can't, he has actually done an all right job in terms of other aspects. I still don't think personally he's that good a player. I think he's all right. Yeah, like, I, he I think right. also, I, I would call him a failure at different points in, in, in North. But I just wouldn't say it's like that right now. And I also think there's points where he's gotten way too much shit. Uh, okay. Like way more than I think he was. He was definitely the lightning rod for criticism for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like if it's not him, it's easy. And I mean, I I don't know much about what's going on on that team speak, but there's probably you know it's probably not a coincidence that AZ went to you know TSM. No, it wasn't TSM back in the day. It was, it was Dignitas. Dignitas for, yeah. yeah, and then he went to. Yeah, I guess um, was he went to Phase first, right? And then he went back to the to the other dignitas like no no it was the other way same. around he went to the the problem is they changed the dignitas teams changed the names basically at the next year so he was in dignitas who became tsm but he then went to dignitas then he yeah, went exactly. to g2 which became yeah it's like it's complicated but you get the point okay yeah well i just thought he went to 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 phase for no no it was the other way around. then went back to the, okay but but no matter what like it's you can always talk shit about a player right but if that sure. guy has stayed on a team for two years the same team there's probably a reasoning behind it. Like I, I obviously I'm I don't know it, and it could also be that he's just the worst player ever to grace the game. But I'm just thinking like nah, logically, if mate, he the easy the one's field, obvious, probably good. the easy one's absolutely obvious to me from the outside. It's like this guy obviously just does whatever the fuck his job is within the team. Now to outsiders, you might not like that, but his teammates like put it this way. The the real tell for me that is he isn't a shit player is there's players who've left the team that he's in who've still never commented on him in interviews. Like if you left, like let's say, right, you were in a team and we'll give you an example, like an obvious one that no one's going to find controversial. Let's say you played in G2 when it's Shocks and Smiths are in the team and people know for the last few years, at least, the only reason Smiths would be in one of those teams is Shocks demands it. And it's kind of taken for granted if you play on that team, you're not even going to bring up that issue. You're not going to come to Shocks and go, maybe we should cut this Smiths guy because you know that, that you know, that's just not not realistic proposition. So in that scenario, right, the difference is if you played with that team and it didn't, you know, live up to expectations or you you didn't win the championships you were supposed to, or you lost a bunch of big games. Eventually, one day in an interview years later, when you're not going to play with those guys anymore, you'd at least make some sort of a comment like, you know, and of course we had to have Smiths, you know, or you might even directly flame him. You might say, I never thought he was that good. And, you know, the in-game leader demanded we had him. There'd be a way that the info would get out, basically, if people really thought that. This is not 
exaggeration. I've said the same about MSL, by the way. You can't find interviews where people diss these guys. Like, whether fans think they're good or not, like, all the people who've played with them have some level of respect for these guys and think that they can in some way play their roles. Because it's actually... Players in Counter-Strike don't need an excuse to kind of, like, talk shit or blame other people. But you notice it never happens. I've actually never heard of it with either of these guys. So that's a pretty good kind of, like, you know, a a check in their favour, as it were. Those are the hardest teammates to cut even like when it's blatantly necessary i'm not saying oh, it is course. in this situation but i bet i bet them cutting config was probably the easiest decision they've ever made yeah yes. even even despite the fact that when they cut him he was playing like a top 10 player in yep. the world he was absolutely fucking incredible but it was probably the easiest decision they've ever made because they're just like get this guy the fuck away from i can't handle it anymore yes but there's those really good ones like the msls the az's <laughs> those are the hard ones and and especially I mean, I think this is, I think, is the root of what North has at the moment is the two guys that, you know, the story around them is to be the star player is all the potential of AZ that we've known about, which is, as you just mentioned, just, you know, a second ago, why he was brought onto the old, you know, TQM and TSM and Dignitas core of the, of the Astralis guys now, like the potential was there. Same with Kirby, but now they bring in Yugi and Gate and those guys are the ones who have to step up and be the star, but they don't have the experience and they're not reaching their potential either. So for North at the moment, it's just like they seem confused on who's supposed to be the star player or who's going to be the star player and who's going to carry them and be the player who can, who can dig deep and get them through matches with the high volume kills. They don't have any of those players at the moment. In my opinion. I agree. I think that's the problem. Yeah. I would also say I agree. I mean, when, when you mentioned, uh, Gail gate, like, I think How do you he's... say his name properly. Say his name and then it's just, just once Gil. Oh, yeah, I'm... yeah, but uh, I mean, he's like I think he's twenty four, perhaps, and he's yeah I think one of the oldest players on that team. So even though he comes in as young blood, it's kind of the same with with Lecro when he came into. I can't remember. Fantastic. I guess it was yeah. Was I've it God's first though? I'm not sure. Oh, you're right. A lot it was of good God's things. Yeah. Uh, what did you say? Sorry. I've heard a lot of really good things about about Gade. It's, that's how I'm going to say his name. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I also heard that. I mean, I I don't talk too much to the North guys. I I, I don't like. Uh, I mean, I I don't dislike them at all. But we're just not really, you know, friends. We don't speak. Um, but I remember when Gate was coming up in the scene, it was always like mentioned how incredible his aiming was, of course, but also how he put in so many hours in his like aim bots routine. And even in between maps, it didn't matter if he had like a good map or a bad map. He would always in those like five, ten minutes where I, you know, get some water, take a breather, prepare myself mentally for the next game, he would just be doing aim bots all the time. Sure. And Blame F used to do the same thing. And I used to say, like, oh, what's been going on? He goes, What map? Never play, never played any maps, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, it I mean Blame F is also crazy with, with his aim bots. Like it's it's I insane, it but yeah. But but it's like, um, you know, those hardworking players. Um, it's just it's hard to really say anything negative about them, right? Sure. If they have a if they have a personality that's not, uh, you know, uh, in any way constricting the team, then it's like it's I'll, really I'll hard to it, find reasons to talk like, shit about them. Like here's one of the ways I'll explain it to a fan who's who has never been in these teams, so they don't get like the why it would be different, like why you wouldn't just evaluate, you know, how much does someone frag, how did you know, how do they look in the server? Is there are certain things in the game that never show up on a scoreboard and are actually required for certain styles of team to work. And they're not sexy. Some of it is just something shit like throwing a flash from an angle that's like really boring to set up and you have to even watch your back when you're doing it because you can just get flanked. Stuff like that that like no one's interested in and you won't get any credit for outside the team. But inside the team, you will get credit. Like people will understand you do things that are like tough or more difficult, etc. And especially if you've got all these social aspects, like you're a great teammate, you keep the mentality. Sometimes I even say one of the positive you can have is just don't be a problem if you've already got a couple of big egos in the team sometimes a guy just not being an ego at all is a massive positive that way we can deal with these two guys because the rest of them are all fine so in this kind of a world like from the outside it's never going to look like that person does anything but actually they do on some level and so 
I agree. The problem is it can go too far the other way and then they stay in teams for too long if they are, in fact, bad players. Like, obviously, they can have those qualities and then the skill can drop off. Whoa. But it's like there's a saying they have in basketball that they often say. Same, I know it's American football. They say the same thing. They say the reason why every player should be able to play defense is because defense is about hustle, not talent. Like, it's about how much hard work you put in. And if you have hard work and a good mentality, you can still get things done in the game. You don't have to be that sick at the game. Also, I think part of the reason why some of these some of these factors of players, you know, we we don't really know much. It's it's hard to quantify them, and they're they're very intangible. But it's I think that's that can't be around for much longer because you have to imagine as well if you're someone who wants to scout out young talent or young players to bring up to the next leagues or find the new or the next big sure. like a money ball type situation. Someone is going to learn how to how to use stats or something that can be gathered in game to actually quantify sure. those statistics to a level that you can start looking at them. And then we can find them in the spreadsheet and then we can find them inside, yep. you know, correlated inside the game and actually make content around it. Or, you know, you can use it to scout and point things out and you can use it to coach and train. So those things I think over time are just easily going to be more and more identifiable in each player. It's just a matter of, I guess, the industry catching up to, to everything else in a way. I can see what you mean. Like it would have to be some advanced stat, you yeah. know, like it'd be beyond just, but you it's know, only, flash it's, only, it's only a matter of time. Yeah, there's... but no, I agree. I think logically, especially with the amount of data and count shit, you should be able to model it. So maybe it would be something like, maybe there's some stat for like, it's like a flash assist for an entry that then gets two kills that opens a certain site, you know, or, or you play a certain spot, like some of the classic ones where you have to play a solo on a site while someone rotates off. You know, maybe it isn't kills. Maybe it's something yeah. like how many seconds you stay alive when they enter the site or how many times you are able to trade before you, you know, something like, it'd be something that wouldn't seem as crazy in the gaming with your eyes. But yeah, if you could find like a column where this guy who should be like the 50th best player in your mind jumps to like fifth best player, suddenly his value would go way up because in the future you would hope it'll be like sports and the guys who do the recruiting aren't just the players going like, well, I've played with this guy and he's good. It's like, no, someone can actually go and do a deep dive and find, I know you guys might not have heard of this guy, but look at all these things I can show you. Let's give him a go. He might actually be like, the next like hidden gem as it were you know yep but i think we're seeing that more and more as well wasn't it um can't remember who exactly did the interview um but it was it was on uh, hotv when navi picked up uh, boomich it was simple it was, yeah when he said that he said that basically blade had scouted all three players they were checking yeah. and that he'd watched a hundred hours of demos of boom yeah so like exactly. way above and beyond what anyone else would have yeah. done for almost any player ever recruited as far as i know and I think that's what's going to be the norm in the future as well. Like, obviously, you can do uh, some stat analysis, but it's. I remember we did it as well in um, Sprout, for example, Cyclone. He always did it when we were thinking about picking up a new player. In this case, it was. Um, uh, we were actually thinking about picking up Faven already before he was picked up. Right. And um, basically, um, he uh, he watched a ton of demos, like, saw that okay, this guy has insane stats, but he's also like playing sort of an entry role and he's just doing a good job, you know? Then we got to the conclusion that this guy might be more than just, you know, having good stats. He's just actually a, a well-rounded player and it's not like he's, you know, it's also quite easy to see if you're just letting your teammates run in first all the time, right? Um, in In this scenario, that wasn't the case and that's why we decided that we would, you know, go with him. Um, having played with him then for a few months, means that I also know well enough that that, you know, um, the result of that analysis he did from the demos was the actual result. Like, Feynman is a really, really, really strong player um, as well. And I'm sure he'll be, you know, up there amongst the top 20 players at some point um, when he gets a bit more experience and, and like, when he gets a bit older. Um, so I think that's going to be the norm. Like, I heard it from different teams as well that when they want to figure out who is the better fit for their team, they go and watch demos and figure out, you know, what's what. Because I have to say, that's one area as well, like especially the level you were playing at the last couple of years, which is really, really troublesome, is there is way too much uh, bias towards old names. So if a player who might have been really good two years ago, but now actually might be terrible for maybe even for good reason, maybe they don't play as much, they have a girlfriend or something, whatever reason might have drawn them away from the game. The problem is, if you were in what, like in the past, it would have been teams like Heroic even, 
the, that's the player who's going to get recruited there instead of maybe someone who might be a mad up and coming talent but doesn't have the rep for it yet. Like, you know, they haven't proven themselves or maybe they're a little bit troublesome or whatever. So I feel like the bias towards the old names was huge. Like in the NA scene, especially, there's also the case, like a lot of recycling of names. And I get, here's the thing, on one level, I get it because if you get lucky, it's like you, you, you can think of it like the stock market. You're thinking to yourself, well, this guy ever gets back to where he was, I'm buying low now. If I get him in the team now, maybe we get really good, but... The amount of times that actually happens, it's not that high. So rare. It's not that high. So I have to say, I do feel like people are going too far with that. Like I'd, I'd sometimes rather gamble on the young talent and let, let younger players have a chance. Yeah, it is rare. You see the like young guys come up and not perform to what you expected of them, at least. So if you just give them time and you give them proper coaching, typically you get a pretty good result. I can at least off the top of my head just like mention a young player who got picked up and then just completely flunked. Not in one of the like... Well, I think that's, the whole, that's the whole point of them, isn't it? That you, don't, sure. you just don't remember who they are. Is there actually, yeah, by the okay. way, can you can you use the crystal ball and tell us, like, is there any player who isn't right now an Astralis, North, or X-Optic? Mm-hmm. Is there like another player in the scene who you would pick like, a mark him as the next one. He's going to be the next really sick Danish player. Who would you pick? I think I'm probably the wrong to ask because I don't play like we have Danish Pro League. I, I assume you guys know what that is. Like I think you have it in NA as well. I think you have like the mythic leagues and stuff like that where you I think it's you know, it's it's better than just random five or five or yeah. five face it and then it's for basically I mean in, in NA it would just be NA, right? But, yep. but Denmark they have their own, Sweden have their own, stuff like that. Right. I don't play that so much, but there are definitely some names, like even just playing random face it's I'm running into it happened like two weeks ago less i think i ran into two danish players on the same day and i had heard about neither of them and both of them were at least one of them he had like incredible aiming like really really crazy aiming i I, he wrote to me afterwards that he had like you know the game of his life or whatever but even then i i think that was he he was really a crazy aimer so i know there's there are some names that people might not have noticed yet um one of the ones that will surely be there like in the near future, is uh, Nodius, I think. I've heard a lot of people mention his name, at least. Um, don't know much about him, never played with him, but I only heard good things. Um, he's got, like, a super high sensitivity, but, but he's got really, really great aiming from what I've seen. Um, there's also a guy that Frexters or ex-Frexters recruited after they lost Stown, and it was kind of like, I made a joke that it was like a budget Stown. Um, but his name is Tuft. Um, again, don't know much about him, but he's young. He's also he's, a young player, right? Yeah, yeah, he's 16 or something like that. And at least he's been putting up the numbers mostly. So I think, um, I don't know, I think he needs probably a few more years. Um, I think Nodius, he might be 18, 19, something like that. But for most for most people I've talked to, granted it hasn't been many from like the ex-Optic Heroic and, and that those type of types of teams, it's been the teams just below it. But they've like all said good things about him, both about his personality and his play. So I think if he continues to put in the work, then he will get there eventually. Okay. All right, Moses, I think, uh, are, we, are you good? Do you want to end the episode now? Yeah, that's fine. I think, I think we're at a pretty good one. I'll just say, by the way, at the end of the episode, everyone out there, just Google the name Max Headroom. That's all you're going to Google. That's just a little Easter egg for people as we exit uh, this this episode. If you've ever seen what I'm <laughs> talking about, I'm just saying, just saying. <laughs> Just saying. I'm just saying. This video was kindly supported by Patrick Ribeiro, Penguin Off 9, Dean Tanglis, Andreas Snazor Westerland, Fat Guy Got 24 ADR in an Online Qualifier, Lee Chow Lan, Blunt Smoking Anus Destroyer, J Dobbs, Ho Chi Mao, Tobias Bernasconi, Nate DOGG, Alexander Rao, Collier G. And as always, special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion. Now, do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for some of my content? Obviously, I have quite a varied output. Do you want to ask me a question for my monthly video AMA? Maybe you want teasers, see who the guests are on my next shows. Do you want to take part in a donator discussion with me about esports? Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Skrilluminati today in the description box below. There's a Patreon link.